So friends, uh, before I request Professor Sanjan to speak, I must introduce her. We'll see there's no introduction, but uh, I should mention that she's a uh, professor of Department of Philosophy at the University. She also headed the Arvind Dalsi Arvinda Center of Center. She created that too. Created, yeah. Created and headed. <laughs> okay, yeah. And uh, her areas of specialization are media ethics, Indian and Western, metaphysics, philosophy of logic and language, philosophy of Sarabinda. She has authored and co edited many, many books. Let me mention at least some of them. Uh, the, our author's books are the Through the Lanes of the Ethics, Modality Essence, and uh, Possible Worlds. Then she has co edited. Essentialist claims, Dharma uh, Nithi or Shruti, ethics and culture, Sri Aurobindo and his contemporary thinkers, education and practice, thoughts of Sri Aurobindo, uh, refugees, uh, marriage, asuras and marriage, and anthology, and uh, so and so forth. So, she is well uh, equipped to speak on Sri Aurobindo's. Uh, to ethics, and she has done work so much on Dharma ethics. So, uh, really, will be very enlightened by her, by her uh, presentation. I now request Professor Sanjay to speak. Shridangshu Shekhar Chakraborty for arranging this seminar and also giving me an opportunity to present my views with all this August gathering. And also I express my thanks to the institution, Indian Institute of Advanced Study Shimla and Professor Makadam Taranjape for giving scope for organizing this seminar. And also my thanks to my chair, to <coughs> Professor R.C. Pradhan. And now I would like to begin my talk. And in fact, the topic for my lecture is today <coughs> on Sri Aurobindo's Metaphysics of Morals vis-a-vis -vis the Western model of virtue ethics. Actually, Sri Aurobindo, we know, was a versatile genius and he was really a great philosopher. Apart from his other, we can say, characterizations, that is, he was a yogi, he was a politician, and in fact, when somebody asked Sri Aurobindo to write an article for an anthology in comparative philosophy, he said, no, 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 I'm not a philosopher. And from that, somebody and many people used to say that Sri Aurobindo actually was not a philosopher. But that is a very, very wrong conception. And in fact, when Sri Aurobindo was editing Arya Review, he said that, yes, I was never a philosopher. I never read any philosophy, but philosophy came to me. This is his acknowledgement, that philosophy came to me. Now, in this lecture, when I'll be speaking on Sri Aurobindo's metaphysics of morals, actually, it was the topic that was also suggested to me by Professor Chakraborty 
and I found actually this is going to be a great research project. And in fact, in this talk, it won't be possible for me to cover all the aspects, but I thought at least I will point out some of the aspects, and mainly I would like to explore, of course briefly, the main domain of metaphysics of morals as it has been envisioned by Sri Aurobindo. Now, my objective is to introduce the viewpoint of Aurobindo Ghosh on metaphysics of morals, and secondly, I think his viewpoint is unique for various reasons, and if we want to compare it with the Western model of ethics, it may be taken to be closer to what is known broadly as virtue ethics. And finally, this is, I'm just commenting, it is a prototype of dharma ethics. Now, in this lecture, I would like to give some account from Sri Aurobindo about the genesis of morality. And one thing I would like to point out that though there is some very important, subtle distinction between morality and ethics, and we also know that in Indian, uh, in Western li literature, mos and ethos that are also distinguished. But here in my talk, I will be using the expressions quite loosely, one for the other. Of course, Sri Aurobindo also made a very careful observation on this point. But I'm not entering into all these things. Now, <clears throat> Now we are talking about morality, we are talking about ethics, but the main question is how do we, how do we come to know about what is morality, what is the source of our being moral, what is the source of our formulating different ethical laws, principles. Now Sri Aurobindo conjectures that morality is born as an instinct of right. Here, he is emphasized on the notion instinct. And he says, instinct of right and instinct of self-sacrifice, instinct of love or self-subordination and of solidarity with others. That is, sometimes we say that morality comes from within, and Sri Aurobindo would say that it, it is born out of instincts. Now here I would only say very loosely that for Sri Aurobindo, instinct is a very, very crude version of intuition. Now, again, if we want to understand Sri Aurobindo's view on morality, we have to get some idea about his metaphysics. And in fact, here his ideas on morality is very closely linked with his metaphysical presuppositions. And actually, we call Sri Aurobindo, at least I hear, projecting Sri Aurobindo as a metaphysician. But sometimes it seems to me the right expression here should have been a metaphysicist. Actually, if we go deep into detail in his view, we will find that though he is transcending the levels of physics, he is going beyond the realms of the physics, but he is pursuing his philosophy really in a very, very scientific. Again, quote, um, it is very, uh, 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 it is my insertion because he won't say, because there are different senses of science. But actually 
what he is looking after. That is how this all those moral, that is what we call moral impulses, where from these moral impulses have come. Now, he relates his answer to this question with this evolutionary framework. Now, to understand his theory of evolution, that is, we know it is a law and really very great thing. But here I would just like to point out in a nutshell that he speaks of Brahman and he characterizes Brahman as Shachidananda, that is Shat, Chit and Ananda, that is existence, consciousness and bliss. Now for him this Chit is Chit Shakti, that is not only consciousness but conscious energy and what actually is Brahman? Brahman is energy. He calls Brahman, that is consciousness, as energy. And actually, what he gives in his metaphysics, it is just, it has been said very appropriately, that is adventure of consciousness. That is, whole thing has been explained by him, that is whole creation, everything in the world, what we call morality, these are all just results of consciousness force, energy, and movements of consciousness that he says that he got that idea from Isho Upanishad. In fact, one of his earliest version of Life Divine, it was written that it is an interpretation of Isho Upanishad. So, I'm not, without entering into the detail, I'm coming to the main theme of today's talk. Now, at the initial stage, that is, through the process of evolution, he says that there is a process of evolution. Through that process of evolution, everything comes into being. And for him, this conscious energy, it has two stature. One is its static, and another is dynamic. That is, one is, one is, we can say that Shanto and the other where Brahman is active, when Brahman is actively operating, that is when energy is active. And when Brahman is active, all this process of creation begins. And he explains with, with the concept of evolution. But here I would also like to point out that though Sri Aurobindo is writing during the time when Darwin's theory of evolution was already had created really great, we can say, influence on the learned or on the Western world, but though he is using the expression evolution, we must keep in mind that he is developing the notion of evolution from Upanishad. That is his, that we should keep in mind. Now, so what happens? At the initial stage, now I'm coming, that we take it for granted that man, as a product of evolution, has already appeared in the scene. Now, at the initial stage, Man obeys the law of instinct, but does not raise questions about the reason or purpose for making allowances for instincts and yielding to instincts. So what happens? That man gradually also matures, develops. Now when something we go on performing, we don't question. That is why I should do it or who is here authority, who is, who is making me that I should, that is from where this imperative comes, that is source of pravartana, that is not being questioned. But mind begins to ask why and where from questions with the appearance of reason. So man's development that is also gradual. Gradually man develops 
And ethics, according to this view, is a stage in evolution. Now, Sri Aurobindo makes sense of morality both from the viewpoint of Satchidananda and human individual. That is, morality is a middle point. So here, Satchidananda, that is consciousness, force, energy, has its movement. It has some definite role to play. And by its playing activities, something has come into being. Human. Human with cap man with capital M and man with small m. Well, it's individual. Again, all these stages have been elaborated by Sri Aurobindo, but I don't have any time to enter into all these details. But what is common to all these stages? Now, the urge of Shachidananda towards self-expression. That is, what is his main view? That there is consciousness energy, and consciousness is consciousness force, and it contains within itself art for self-expression. And this art of self-expression leads to all this creation. And this art for self-expression, broadly speaking, can be divided into three levels, or three, we can say, levels. Now, this art for self-expression is first non-ethical, then infra -eth that is, infra-ethical. And he says that infra-ethical in animal and even in intelligent animal, anti-ethical. That is the first stage we can say, it is the infra-ethical stage of self-expression of the consciousness energy. The stage below humans is infra-ethical and the stage above human, humans, we would say, supra-ethical. And at this stages, that is, at the stage of infra-ethical and at the stage of supra-ethical, there is no need of ethics. The ethical impulse is important, and ethical impulse and attitude is important to humanity. Is a means by which it struggles out of the lower harmony and universality based upon in conscience. Now the first manifestation of the consciousness energy is in the form of inconscient matter. So from the inconscient matter, other forms try to evolve. Now when life, life manifests in matter, life struggles to get out of this less harmonious state of existence. And further, in life, when mind when mind evolves in life. Now, another thing important that generally when we talk about evolutionary theory that we get from the West, there it is said that monkeys developed into man. That is, evolution has been understood in that way. But Sri Aurobindo, for him, mentality evolves in vitality and vitality just evolves into matter. So this emerging is in different order. And man struggles towards a higher harmony and universality based upon conscient oneness with all existences. The first emergent, I have already mentioned, but let me read it out also. The first emergent from the inconscient is matter. And in matter, falsehood and evil cannot exist. Of course, Sri Aurobindo, from his metaphysics we find he was Satkarya Vadi. Now, in philosophy, Satkarya Vadi would accept that effect exist in the cause who 
put in Shirdi. Of course, Sri Aurobindo would also admit here, but actually, if we try to understand matter from our point of view, it seems that falsehood and evil cannot exist in matter. But maybe that these are also potentially contained in matter. Now the indwelling secret consciousness is one, whether it is in the matter, whether it is in the vital level, or whether it is in the mental level. Now, fire walks a man or burns him. A medicinal herb cures a person or, or a person kills another. But the point is that here, the duality of good and evil is not native to the material principle. It is absent from the world of matter. Fire burns. We say these are all natural. No, we never say that, that fire has burned. That is, it has caused some evil. We don't say. The origin of uh, the duality begins with conscious life and emerges fully with the development of mind in life. And the vital mind, the mind of desire and sensation, is the creator of the sense of evil and the fact of evil. So, in fact, really it is very difficult <coughs> to explain Sri Aurobindo's viewpoint in just in one lecture because there are so many classifications and stratifications in his metaphysics. When he talks about mind, mind is nothing one simple. Mind is a great complex <coughs> something. Mind contains, mind develops into, its development is into vital existence and vital existence develops into matter. So when mind evolves, mind carries with itself all those appendages, that is physicality, vitality, everything. So according to him, there are different sorts of mind again, physical mind, vital mind, and mental mind. But that is not enough. Mind does not stop there. Mind goes on farther and farther developing. So mind has higher mind level. Mind has intuitive mind level. And in that way, mind will go to the super mind level. And mind will go. In between, there will be another over mind level. Again, these stratifications, that is not all. Mind has subconscient level, mind has surface level. So for him, mind, it is really a very, very complex something that we find in Sri Aurobindo. And for him, the desire soul, that is vital mind, that is the source of all these moral moralities, that is when we are distinguishing between good and bad, evil and non-evil. <clears throat> so here he says clearly the vital mind, the mind of desire and sensation is the creator of the sense of evil and of the fact of evil. Of course, I must also men mention another another really very, very important level of mind that is psychic, psychic mind. That is the most important one here. In animal life, the fact of evil is there in the form of suffering and in the sense of suffering. Form of suffering and sense of suffering. The evil of violence, cruelty and strife and deception, but the sense of moral evil is absent. Are moral values subjective? This question may be raised. Now, Sri Aurobindo admits that infrarational truth of life and matter 
is neutral and impartial and admits all things as facts of nature. Nature, he writes with capital N. And there is too a supra-rational truth that formulates itself in spiritual experience. And the medium level of consciousness is sensitive to the value of good and evil. And this middle step is the indispensable step in the evolutionary process. And here we talk about evil, suffering, goodness, badness, etc. Now, what is in the human being that leads to the genesis of moral values? What gives it power and place for evoking or arousing the sense of good and evil? Sri Aurobindo entrusts the initial role to the vital mind. As I have already said, desire soul for drawing a distinction between good and evil. The valuation that comes from the vital mind, because that is the very feature of vital mind, that it is sensational and individual. So how, how, what kind of response we can expect from the vital mind? Now, whatever is beneficial, useful to the life we go is considered to be good. Now, whatever is malefic, destructive, and unpleasant to the life we go is evil. So the first reaction is in this way, that we get from the vital mind. The second valuation, it is important, the second valuation is utilitarian and social. All that promotes sustenance, development, etc., of associated life, community life, social life, and its unity is considered good. Whatever is con contrary to the betterment of a society is considered evil. So first, it is, it is a step towards protecting self-interest and then, then a step towards social interest. And in terms of that interest, ethical or moral valuation is done. Now, with the coming of thinking mind, that is mental mind, thinking mind tries to find laws or principles, rational or cosmic, or something like law of karma, or to develop ethical system founded on reason, emotion or aesthetic. Actually, this is the stage when we can say truly what we call ethical principles, they come into being. They are formulated and in different ways according to different understanding that we get from different rational sources. Now, now religion preaches the role of God in determining what is good or evil. Now, again, some seek for deeper hidden truth, something within us that has intuition of that truth. Thus, in this approach, full weightage has been given to the inward spiritual psyche. That is, what, from where we get the guidance? Is it from God? Is it from within? Again, psyche is much more than the mind or life, and it is, in Sri Aurobindo's language, soul personality. Now, questions may be raised about the nature of this spiritual or psychic witness and the value of sense of the good and evil to it. Some possible answers are the following. Some may suppose that the sense of evil and good incline the embodied being to turn away from the relative world of good and suffering to the absolute. This is one approach. In fact, if we go to, through different philosophical literature, we are quite familiar with some such approaches. Jagat Dukkhamai, so one way 
is to avoid the world. Now, some may suppose that the sense of evil and good incline the embodied <coughs> being to turn away from the relative world of good and suffering to the absolute. Then one will be able to get moksha, liberation, and that will save him from all those, we can say, stripes and struggles of vital existence. Now, according to the Buddhist, the sense of good and evil may serve to prepare for the dissolution of the ignorant ego complex and the escape from the personality and suffering. This is Buddhist prescription, that is Nirvana. Now, according to Sri Aurobindo, the awareness of embodied being about good and evil is a spiritual necessity of the evolution itself. Now, this is very much novel aspect of Sri Aurobindo's philosophy. That is, we should not shun evil. We should not go after nirvana and moksha because we must face this. That is, we must go through it. And it is, he says, it is a spiritual necessity for our evolution because he believes in evolution, in development of our being. That is the ultimate goal. And it is a step towards the growth of the being out of the ignorance into the, into the truth of divine unity. Now, sometimes I see, though I don't have any time to enter in any detail into Sri Aurobindo's metaphysics, but Sri Aurobindo presents a monistic view, no doubt, he speaks about Shachidananda as Ekameva Madhityam. But one thing we must keep in mind that though he speaks of one, now sometimes to make sense of his monism, it is characterized as integral monism. That is, it is the ultimate. It is the ultimate. But he never, he never disregards this physical world and never says that it is to be shunned. But through it, we have to go out. That is his philosophy. Now, the growth of the soul is a growth. Here, growth, that is, here, soul, that is, of the whole, is a growth out of the darkness. <coughs> this is, this is very much I have just, I have shortened his statement and I have written it because it is very difficult to avoid his language, his way of expression. Because if I don't use his expressions, it seems I'm not able to give you the fit, just the real taste of his expressing himself. The growth of the soul. We will have time for you in the wrap up session. 10 minutes or so, just for you because you didn't have enough time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, tomorrow. <laughs> the growth of the soul minutes. is a growth out of the darkness. And today I think, how, how long I'm going to get my time? I'll be able to finish this one. Oh, by least. all means. I will please. pick out the time for you. Okay, please continue. The growth of the soul is a growth out of the darkness into light. Of course, these are all very, we can say, figurative, metaphor metaphorical way of speaking, but it carries deeper truth. That growth of the soul is a growth out of the darkness into light, out of falsehood into truth, and out of suffering into its supreme and universal ananda. And the soul's perception of good and evil may not coincide with mind's artificial standards. The superior spiritual light is beyond good and evil. Sri Aurobindo discovers an evolutionary purpose in this working of nature. He emphatically asserts that it must be necessary. It must be there so that man may leave certain things behind him move towards others until out of good and evil he can emerge into some good that is eternal and infinite. 
and Sri Aurobindo without any equivocation asserts his belief in the evolutionary intention of nature to fulfill itself. Actually, we will see that for Sri Aurobindo, the great wage between fact and value, nature and morality does not exist. Great. Naturalistic, as they insist in the West. Yes. But evolutionary nature must require some power, means, impulsion, and some principle and process of selection and harmonization to execute the intended goal. The mind of man perennially pursues the principle of selection and rejection. Now this principle has presented itself differently either in a garb of religious sanction or social and moral rule of life or as ethical ideal, that is how to reach light, how to go from the darkness to light. So what are the principles, reasoning, rational mind in different ways, in different culture, in different time, formulate different principles. And these means adopted by the mind of man are empirical in nature. The mind is unfit for tracing the cause and origin of the malady of the problem it attempts to cure. Mind deals with the problem of good and evil with the symptoms, and this is Sri Aurobindo's word, perfunctorily. Because we don't, so long we are confined to the mind, to the mental level, we cannot actually trace the real cause, source of all those evils and suffering. So mind does not know about the significance of the opposites, like good and evil, in relation to the intention of nature. And why do mind and life support them and sustain their being? Sri Aurobindo affirms relative characteristic of human good and evil. The standards are also of uncertain and relative evaluation because these are, these are all products of mind and different minds formulate these principles following different standards. This explains why religions differ from one another as to what is permitted and forbidden. Because if we follow the standard of religion, religion is not one. There are so many religions, and so they have different standards for evaluation of what is good and what is bad. The standard or criterion prescribed by ethics varies specific to culture, time period, and country. Now, similarly, we find social norms are also subjected to diversification. <coughs> So what is considered useful for a society or what is taken to be good by social opinion or what is considered beneficial for the society are not fixed absolutely. Hence, Sri Aurobindo includes all these factors along with moral and ethical <coughs> to the domain of relatives. Now the one question with which I I began here that are moral values subjective? Now, these are relatives. But mind plays the role of a controller over our vital and physical desires and instincts. Mind also regulates our dealing with other members of society, our individual and personal checks with our own self. Sri Aurobindo would say that a managerial, uh, of course I got that, <laughs> I, have, I have used this term because I find that people in management, they are also <coughs> using this expression very much. So I thought this will be very good expression, that this managerial check done by the mind is an experient one, never a solution. That is, we propound different standards, we say, we will go for egoistic principle, we go for utilitarianism, we go for rule utilitarianism, we go for other sorts of variations, but these are all different varied principles. They are not permanent.
apparent solutions to evils and suffering through which human beings have to go through. <coughs> he says that, this is quotation from Sri Aurobindo, man remains always what he is and has ever been, a mixture of good and evil, seen and virtue, a mental ego with an imperfect command over his mental, vital and physical nature. Now, Sri Aurobindo expresses his high opinion about the human endeavor for the sustenance of the good and casting out evils and remold ourselves in the model of the ideal. Now, there is undoubtedly human limitations, so the ideal opted by human mind has limitations. The true part, this is again a quotation from Sri Aurobindo, the true call upon us is the call of the infinite and the supreme, expresses the viewpoint of Sri Aurobindo. Ethics in its essence is not a calculation of good and evil in the action or a labored effort to be blameless according to the standards of the world. Those are only crude appearances. It is an attempt to grow into the divine nature. Ordinarily, ethics is regarded as a sort of machinery of right action. The act is everything <coughs> and how to do the right action is the whole question. But for the jogin, the action is important, not for its own sake, but rather as a means of the growth of the soul God word. Again, I will explain that when Sri Aurobindo is speaking about God word, this expression God word has to be understood in a very spacious sense. It is no such religious God. There is no kind of dogmatic <coughs> approach in Sri Aurobindo's metaphysics. In its refined sense, from the spiritual point of view, ethics is the path for developing in our actions and still more essentially for developing in the character of our being the divine self in us. Ethics prepares our growing into the nature of Godhead. <coughs> that is, instincts gradually, gradually develops in our mind through its different levels, through its different layers, and actually ethics is a tool for preparing <coughs> ourselves. It prepares for our journey into the nature of Godhead. And according to the Jogin, action is cheap, cheap, but rather as Therefore, what Indian spiritual writings lay stress upon is not so much on the quality of the action to be done as the quality of the soul from which the action flows upon its truth, fearlessness, purity, love, benevolence, compassion, absence of the will to heart, and, uh, and upon the actions <coughs> as their outflowings. And according to this tradition, it is affirmed that human nature contains passionate Rajushit elements and its down tending tamushik quality but is but that is not the whole picture about human nature there is a purer shaktik element and it is the encouragement of this in fact here i would like to say that in many cases i have followed sri aurobindo's way of writing sanskrit expressions so i have written shaktik with w but generally we write with v now this highest part of it is the concern of ethics. This enables heightening of the divine nature, doivi prakriti, which is present in human nature, and to get rid of, that is, adoivi, that is, ashuri prakriti. <coughs> and in the Indian view, to go in the divine nature is the consummation of the ethical being. And Sri Aurobindo maintains that true ethic is dharma. Again here, 
dharma expression, it is so much overloaded expression, it can be analyzed, understood in a very dogmatic way and at the same time in a very, very secular way. And from Sri Aurobindo we get that secular interpretation of the concept of dharma. So what is dharma? The right fulfillment and working of the higher nature. And right action should have right motive and should be its own justification. And Sri Aurobindo makes a distinction between a natural man and a dharmic man or a truly ethical man. In his opinion, in a natural man, before dharma has arisen, karma and artho are motive to his actions. Karma. 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 Oh, karma. karma. Sorry, karma. Karma. Not karma. Karma. Karma and artho. Sri Aurobindo maintains that God is beyond good and evil. Man moving God worlds must become of one in nature with him. He must transcend good and evil. And again, there are various ways of interpreting this expression. Okay, I'll stop now. Yeah, we, are, we will propose, I am proposing <laughs> that we will continue um, the, uh, the, uh, to the beginning of the panel discussion tomorrow. Okay. Mm. Hmm. Okay, just, I just... 15 minutes or so. Just wrap up. So, <laughs> okay, I, I, I will minutes. just... Please give a conclusion. Godhead, because I want to explain the notion of Godhead from Sri Aurobindo's point of view because he is very much against religiosity. He respects religion, but he has a very special kind of expression, religiosity. And so when he's talking about movement towards Godhead, someone may read a kind of dogmatism in Sri Aurobindo's expression that it is not. This is what I would like to prove and I would like to place before you. And so what is God? God is beyond good and evil implies the following. God is not below good and evil. God is not existing and limited by good and evil. God is not above good and evil. God is in a more absolute sense exceeds and transcends the ideas of good and evil. So let me finish from here because I will have to then enter into the other very important development of morality or ethics that has been suggested by Sri Aurobindo and when he is comparing and contrasting that universalizability. That is, he is a philosopher who does not remain confined to the individual. His whole approach is to reach the universal. And he looks upon ethics also finally as a tool for universalization. But his source is Upanishad, Vedas, and Gita's. And he provides completely, if not completely, in many ways, different interpretations of these literature. But he does not show any disregard or disrespect towards our earlier interpreters. That is his great virtue. And another thing, because he was very much aware of the Western tradition, Western education he was he was he had all his early education in england so he was very much conversant but at the same time he was not either too much heavily depending on the vision of the european culture rather he broke away from that tradition but he was never harsh critic he found many, many good merits and which he tried to explore in his philosophy. So thank you for the present and thanks to Professor Chakraborty and Professor Pradhan for giving me and another We are really thankful to you yeah, no, no, no. Uh, for your excellent presentation, for shortage of time. Yeah, we want to hear more. <laughs>
Yeah, so yeah. at some other occasion, okay. uh, you will also face uh, questions and uh, queries. So thank you once again. Thank you all. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, just a small correction. I mean, I like algebraic topology a lot, but I do algebraic geometry. <laughs> uh, so, uh, 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 I thank the organizers for the invitation to participate in this conference. Uh, the title is a bit strange, uh, and it's not my doing. Uh, it's the same for all of us. <laughs> so, uh, so I can say this, it was, the title was assigned to me by uh, Sri Sivan Sushekar Chakravarti. And it's not the topic I would have chosen. Why? Because there's a lot of literature with this kind of title. Mostly at a popular level. Mostly suggesting that some new discovery in science will give credence or even proof of some spiritual concept. And I don't subscribe to such views. And so I have difficulty taking that literature seriously. But it's not to say that the topic is not deep or, or relevant. It is deep and important. And, and as this is the assigned topic, I will try to lay out a basis for fundamental similarities in the pursuit of science and spirituality. And as you will see, it is connected to virtue ethics. So apart from the popular literature mentioned above, Questions of ethics and spirituality are not normally associated with science, in the sense that we expect science to provide any answers or insights. These questions arise in philosophy and perhaps also in religion, and are for the most part discussed by practitioners of those disciplines. When science does get invoked in these discussions, it is often to debate whether a particular scientific activity or direction is ethical, or whether it is consistent with human values. People will debate whether cloning or genetic modification is ethical, or whether artificial intelligence can ever reflect human values. These are not only questions asked by observers, but by scientists themselves, who are troubled by these kind of questions. They're perhaps looking for a normative framework that will help them to pursue or to support a given direction of scientific research. On the other hand, the great advances of science in describing our world and predicting events have given science an almost religious following. In almost all fields of human activity, there is an effort to formulate ideas in a scientific frame of reference. Spinoza's work on ethics, for example, is an attempt to develop a mathematical approach to ethics, or at least a mathematically styled presentation. If you open it, you'll see there are lemmas and propositions. Even art has been affected by this scientific tendency, as you can see in Cubism, Picasso's School of Cubism. So there is a feeling that ideas derive greater credibility when they have a scientific sanction. While some of these efforts succeed more than others, the very attempt shows the power wielded by science in affecting human behavior. And we find people eager uh, to justify behavior in terms of being scientific and deriding behavior that cannot be so described. You will find marketing literature using words like scientist approved, laboratory tested, to give uh, whatever they are advocating more credibility. All of this is to show that science has a hold on the minds of people as if it is speaking to truth. At the same time, many thinkers will agree that there are limitations to what science can achieve, and it is unrealistic to look to science for authority in dealing with phenomena that lie outside the scope of science. Foremost amongst thinkers who express this view are practicing scientists themselves. The limits of science are quite keenly felt by practitioners of science, but perhaps are not well understood by those who follow science in a popular way. However, perhaps a better understanding of what science is and what its methods are, uh, what its limitations are, can also help us to see its potential as well as its limitation. So let me take a step back and walk us through what science is and what its methods are. So firstly, what is science? Uh, strictly etymologically, if you ask the, what is the word science, it comes from a Latin root, skindere, which means to divide or to dissect. So the idea is that the scientific approach to knowledge is to dissect a complex phenomena into simpler constituent parts. 
By understanding these parts, one gets an idea of the more complex phenomena. So whether one is studying the cosmos, or human anatomy, or the structure of the living cell, the approach of science tends to be to decompose the complex phenomena in front of us into simpler constituent pieces and to attempt to gain an understanding of those pieces. There is even a further effort to find the ultimate building blocks of which even these constituent pieces are composed. And this is a theme in science, including mathematics. It is reminiscent of the Upanishad query, what is that by knowing which all else becomes known? Though the query in the Upanishads may be targeting a broader conception of knowledge than what science is accustomed to, the idea is the same, namely, to understand the fundamental building blocks or some knowledge from which all other knowledge can be deconstructed. Strictly speaking, knowing the building blocks is not the end of the story. One has to supplement the knowledge of the parts with how they work together. How are the constituent pieces put together to assemble the more complex phenomena? Take, for example, sequencing of the human genome. Now it's been done, it's been accomplished, or at least so we're told. Uh, I haven't checked it, but we're told that it has been accomplished. So now we know the stuff out of which the diversity of human life manifests. It's made out of four nucleotides, and we now know the sequence. But knowing the sequence is just the beginning, because it is not yet known what alteration or rearrangement of the sequence will have what effect. And until that is known, the genome sequence is not a useful tool. So there is the knowledge of, of this complex phenomenon, the DNA, which we've now sequenced. So we know the parts. But now how do these parts interact with one another? Until we solve that problem, we don't have it as an actionable knowledge. I mentioned the etymology of the word science. I might point out here, while we edit, uh, something about the word religion. It comes from a Latin root, religio. And that religio means that which holds together. The meaning, literal meaning of the word religion is that which holds together. Incidentally, the Sanskrit word dharma also means the same thing. From this point of view, to understand complex phenomena, we need both science and religion, where I am interpreting these words strictly in terms of their etymological origins. We need to understand the constituent parts of a complex phenomenon, but we also have to understand how those parts fit together and interact with each other. And it is only with this combined approach that we might get a meaningful or comprehensive understanding of complex phenomena. I might add that a similar statement can be made about a comprehensive statement like uh, a similar assertion can be made about a comprehensive statement like Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma. It asserts a fundamental unity, but the task of understanding how that unity manifests in practice is still before us. And this last point is, is I think, what virtue ethics is all about. I might add here mention of another statement, namely the first verse of the Isha Upanishad which states first the principle of fundamental unity and then states how to operationalize it. And I, I will try to return to both of these later in the discussion. So that's, that's a description of what science is, etymologically at least. Now let's talk a little bit about the practice of science. The practice of science, uh, for a moment I'm going to separate mathematics out of this. So the practice of science other than mathematics is contingent on several principles. One is the empirical principle. The empirical principle is the idea that there is order in the universe. What has happened repeatedly in the past will happen again. The sun rises in the east and has done so over millennia of observation and so we expect that tomorrow all other factors remaining constant, the sun will rise in the east. If I drop an object while standing on the earth, it will fall down. This has been observed countless many times. And so barring any reason that to think that something has fundamentally changed, we expect that if I were to drop the object again, it will fall down just as before. This principle, uh, of the empirical principle, of course, is not unique to science. It is also used in philosophy. And in uh, Sanskrit, it's called vyakti, logic. 
Note that the empirical principle helps us to describe a phenomenon and perhaps even elevate it to the level of a principle or a law. Thus, it helps us to elucidate what, but has no answer to the question of why. But our commitment to the empirical principle is such that we will accept the what even when it defies our intuition and we have no answer as to why. An example of this is the way in which the concept of gravity as a force met with a great deal of skepticism but was nevertheless accepted on empirical grounds. We take it for granted now, what you see in the days when it was actually being studied and um, formulated scientifically, there was a great deal of skepticism. Why? Because force, as it had been understood till then, involved an object acting on another object. And gravity did not seem to fit that paradigm. What's the action of the Earth on the other object? It looks like there's actually physical separation. One could not say that the Earth was acting on an object to pull it down. So you have to understand the, the me mechanistic view of force that was in play before. And there was no good explanation of why such an attraction even existed. Why is there gravity? Actually, if you ask this question to people, it's a hard question. Why is there gravity? The formulation of gravity as a, for as a force whose strength could be mathematically modeled and tested on empirical grounds led to its acceptance. So even if I can't answer these questions, the fact that I, can, I have a mathematical model, and using this, I can predict how gravity is going to operate, and my prediction can be verified, is what led to its acceptance. It is interesting that uh, Newton was asked this question, why is there gravity? You know, I, I don't know if you know that Newton was mocked by the public. And in his day, uh, he was mocked by the public. There would be plays. Uh, acted on the on the popular stage in which uh, his theory of fluxions would be uh, would be criticized or, or satirized. Fluxions is of course what he called what we today call derivatives of calculus. Uh, so so here was Newton and he was asked why is there gravity, and what he simply said is I don't speculate. I won't speculate. I make no hypothesis. That's the famous claim. I make no. Sorry. I hope this is non-bingo. Okay, yeah, the original, yeah. So he will not speculate. But on the other hand, gravity did, was formulated in some way by, by Newton, but of course it continues to be a problem even today. Uh, so much later, Einstein was asked the same question. And his answer was a metaphor. Now, what is the metaphor? Namely, think of space as an elastic fabric. And in space, the planets are like billiard balls. Okay. So on an elastic fabric, I put a, a weight, what happens? I create an indentation. Hmm. Now, if I put a, if I have a billiard ball, I put it on, I'm going to create an indentation. Now, if I take a bigger billiard ball and put it sufficiently close by, what will happen is this one will fall into that. If I put a smaller billiard ball, this one will fall into that. On the other hand, if I put some, uh, even a smaller billiard ball, but far enough away, it's not going to be affected by this indentation. And you can see how closely I can bring it so that it's not affected. And there's a critical point. Anything less, it will fall in. Anything more, it won't do anything. Now, you do one more experiment. You find that critical distance at which nothing happens. Now, you give that, the smaller object momentum in the direction normal to this one, in other words, perpendicular to this one. What happens? Do you know what happens? It will orbit. This is, this is nothing to do with the universe. I'm just saying, take a, a sheet of plastic su surface, you know, plastic membrane, put a weight, take another smaller weight, and uh, find the distance at which it doesn't pull the other one in. Now, give this one momentum. Uh, of course, if you give it too much momentum, it will escape, it will go straight. But there is a certain momentum which you can calculate, you give it, and what will happen is it will start orbiting. Now, does that explain what's happening in the universe? Does that explain what gravity is? No. This is a metaphor. Think of space like a fabric. And think of these heavenly objects as billiard balls, or as weights on that fabric. So, Einstein's answer to why is a metaphor. 
and, and this is not a, uh, a casual metaphor. This is an important way of thinking about gravity. And I said that gravity is still a problem for us. Why? Because in trying to find the unified field theory, the, the, a method by which the different forces of nature can be harmonized, gravity is still a, is still a problem. Nuclear forces and electromagnetism uh, can be harmonized, but gravity is still a problem. So it's very important to see how people are, are even today grappling with this question of how or why, and how the uh, uh, leading scientist answer is through a metaphor. So it's not an answer to the question of why there's gravity, it's a metaphor which gives us a way of conceptualizing it. And this is typical of the scientific approach. So those who think that science describes the universe have, have not understood what science does is formulate models that seem to reflect, empirically seem to reflect properties of the universe. And then they study that model. And nowhere do they, do they say this model is the universe. It's a representation. So this is typical of the scientific approach. We understand through models or metaphors. And I don't know how well this is known outside of science. Science models phenomena, studies the model, and uses it to make predictions which then have to be independently validated. So return to the empirical principle, we note, I said when I'm at the beginning that I'm separating mathematics temporarily from the rest of science, but to return now, it is also, the empirical principle is also used in mathematics in order to form an <coughs> idea or a guess of what might be true. So you're trying to understand a certain mathematical phenomena. Uh, what we try to teach students early on uh, is to look at examples, special cases. Uh, so you're trying to ask, find some general principle, look at some special cases, try to understand what's going on there, and then see if you can abstract it. We look at examples and special cases, and it is a very subjective matter to know when you have found a pattern or when you are just looking at an anomaly. But any practicing mathematician will agree that looking at things empirically is a good place to start in trying to get to the truth. The difference in mathematics, as opposed to the experimental sciences like physics that I was talking about, the difference is that it is only a place to start. Whatever heuristics you may have must then be vindicated by logic. So in, in experimental science, you, you vindicate your model by checking what it predicts and then verifying the prediction is valid. In mathematics, you have some examples, you make a, an empirical model, but then you have to prove it by logic. So this is something that beginning students of mathematics find very difficult to understand. Uh, you find this often in, in beginning classes. You ask them to prove something, they check it for n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. Well, it's true, <laughs> but un unfortunately that's not a proof. In mathematics, the concept of proof is very exacting. Thus, in all cases, science believes that the universe has a certain orderliness. Note that we do not have an objective proof that the universe is orderly. We assert it only by appealing to the empirical principle which we believe to be true. Scientists, at least some scientists, may bristle at this description, but at heart, science is predicated on an unproven article of faith, that the universe is orderly, and that that orderliness can be discovered and expressed. And to be clear, the definition of faith, make sure we're all thinking of it the same way, to be clear, the definition of faith is to accept something as true that is not the outcome of reason. So our acceptance of the empirical principle does seem to fit that description. Now, in addition to this belief in the empirical principle, there's a further belief, namely that order can be described, which can be discovered and described. This also is faith because before we solve a problem, we have no argument through reason to prove that we can solve it. Suppose somebody gives you a problem, immediately we start trying to solve it. Well, if you had an idea that it's impossible to solve, why would you waste your time trying to solve it? You're starting with an idea that, ah, oh, maybe I can solve this. So where does that come from? We have no argument to prove that we can solve it, but yet we proceed with full energy to try and solve it. Some people may say, I've solved similar problems in the past. 
But if you say that, uh, so I've solved similar problems in the past, that, that gives me confidence I can solve this one too. But if we accept that, then that's just again the empirical principle, which we've already agreed is an article of faith. Thus, we believe there is order, and we believe that we can describe, discover and describe it, and both are articles of faith. Next, let's discuss the way in which science expresses its thought. The language in which it is described is mathematics. And amongst, uh, not the word that I used, the, the adjective there, it's the language that science uses to express itself. Mathematics is the language of science. Now let me say a few words about language. Amongst all languages used by humans, mathematics has the distinctive feature of being unambiguous. A statement which is ambiguous even if it is clothed in mathematical symbols, will not be considered to be a mathematical statement. We find sometimes social scientists or humanists trying to describe a principle by expressing it as an equation, using some symbols. However suggestive and useful as a metaphor, such an equation is not considered to have mathematical content, unless it is unambiguous. As mathematics is the language of science, such an equation cannot be considered as a scientific statement either. Now the flip side of this unambiguous nature of mathematical statements is that this attribute has been obtained at a price. There is an uncertainty principle in language. You've heard of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Right? The position and momentum of an electron cannot be known at the same time. Well, there is an uncertainty principle in language in which precision and breadth compete with each other. Precision in what? Breadth. 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 The only way to achieve precision in language is by restricting the breadth of ideas that can be expressed in that language. So a concept such as happy is ambiguous and so cannot be described mathematically. At the other extreme are languages such as most spoken languages in which one can express a great wealth of ideas such as being happy as I'm doing right now. But we do this at the price of sacrificing precision. I don't know how to define that. We can describe certain attributes that one might see in a person who is happy, but what happy itself means as an abstraction cannot be described unambiguously. And it is a miracle that in and through that ambiguity we actually communicate. There is no logical explanation for this, but we communicate meaning. So in this sense, ambiguity, if you have a, if you're any computer scientist here, ambiguity is not a defect or a bug of spoken languages, but a feature. It is because languages such as English or Hindi are so ambiguous that, that we can give expression to so many ideas. Are you already categorized? <laughs> good, 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 good. <laughs> I like this. I, I love interacting with philosophers because they have names for everything. <laughs> okay. it, is, it is because of the ambiguity that we have poetry and literature in which the multiple meanings of words are considered praiseworthy. So we note that science, by adopting the language of mathematics, has restricted the range of ideas that it is able to express and therefore discuss. Another principle for the practice of science is the primacy of reason. The tool that the scientist uses to piece together observations into a coherent and consistent explanation is reason. Now given the importance attached to reason, we have to understand both its power and its limits. This is as important to the scientist as to the philosopher. Reason establishes a relationship between facts or observations. Note that it has no power to obtain those facts or observations. Reason only begins after we have, by some means or other, obtained facts and observations. Reason is then finding the act of finding cohesion amongst those facts or observations according to certain rules of logic. Now, to make matters worse, the rules of logic are themselves not the outcome of reason. A basic principle like the law of the excluded middle, you know, if a statement is true, then its negation is false. Uh, 
that's not the outcome of reason. The power of reason to discover connections cannot be underestimated, and the success of science can be attributed to this power. But we also have to understand what reason is not capable of. It cannot get the facts to which reason is applied. Those have to be obtained in some other way. To get those facts, we say that we have some objective method of observation. These form the input, at least in science, these form the input into the process. I, I suspect even outside of science, even philosophers would say you have to observe. These form the input into the process of reasoning. The problem with this is that observation is never objective. This is something that philosophy teaches us, at least in some cases, we know that the act of observation actually changes what is being observed. I just mentioned now the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The act of observing the position of the electron changes its momentum. Because why? To observe the electron, you need to shine light on it. When you shine light on it, you change the, uh, the energy state. And so the momentum changes. So one or the other will change. So the act of observation actually changes what is being observed. And we certainly know this in human behavior. For example, if you try to observe children, uh, you, at one moment they know you're observing, you're observing them, their behavior will change. But, but it's also true in the behavior of matter, as we just saw. But it is not only philosophy that warns us about the subjective nature of perception. There is also physiological evidence. Take, for example, the way we see. How does the eye, uh, how, do the, how, how does the whole process of vision work? <coughs> There was an old theory that uh, uh, somehow these, uh, it functions sort of like a camera. There's a lens and you get some inverted image in there and then you identify it somehow. Uh, this, this is not the currently accepted physiological theory of how vision actually happens. Uh, it's more like uh, the, the eye has a, a large number of tiny sensors. They're called rods and cones. And they are capable of communicating to the brain only one piece of information. I have been hit by a photon. Photon is a particle of light. I have been, by the way, it, photon is an abstraction. It's, a, it's the way we, we sort of understand light. So the, the rod and cone can only tell I have been hit by a photon or I have not. So all of these are connected through nerve, to the optic nerve, to, to the brain center. And then the brain gets a barrage of signals, basically zeros and ones. Yes, I've been hit by a photon, or I have not been hit by a photon. This is happening every single instant. As I'm looking at you, and you're looking at me, this is constantly happening. And what does the brain do with this massive amount of, of data? It assembles it into a picture, as best it can. Now, you can imagine that we're talking about analog devices. That's what a or, or an anatomical system is analog, it's not digital, not yet. <laughs> We're not cyborgs. We, we function with an analog system. That means now, why am I pointing that out? Analog systems are notoriously unreliable. They make mistakes. So you have all this barrage of, of uh, data coming in. The brain is trying to assemble a picture, but it's there is a degree of unreliability in the picture, and yet, when I see you, I don't see a kind of some fuzzy something. I see a very clear picture. When I look at the, the top of that, the, uh, the structure above the door, I see a straight, straight edge. How is it possible that when we have this very coarse image that's coming through to the brain, we don't see a coarse, we, our, our vision is not coarse. And also, I would ask another thing, that the rods and cones, remember, they're working on uh, electrochemical uh, processes, which means uh, the way they tell that, that something has happened is they discharge a certain chemical, or they discharge a certain electric signal. When they do that, the, the receptor, the chemical, chemi chemical in that drops, the level drops, and it takes a, a, a certain amount of time for that to be regenerated. In that intermediate period, this rod or cone is essentially useless. It cannot act. And yet, I don't see flashes of vision. I see, I'm seeing a continuous vision. And as I turn my head from here to here, there's a huge amount of processing that is happening. And yet, we see, how is that possible? 
It is only possible if the brain is proactively filling in details. Moreover, if the brain is actually anticipating what will be seen. In other words, we see what we expect to see. This is a physiological fact. This whole mechanism of rods and cones, there was a Nobel Prize in physiology for this. Uh, so the brain is straightening out the coarse image. So the whole process of vision is not like camera, but more like a computer enhanced image. You might have seen satellite pictures when they come in. They're very coarse, but then they and you see computer enhanced pictures and they look, they look clean. So, so the, the, what we're really looking at is something that the brain has figured out, filled in the pieces to make it a complete picture. Now we can ask, on what basis does the brain straighten out the coarse image? Whatever basis it is, it is not based on perception. It seems to be based on what we expect to see, perhaps from past experience. And there's a saying, you know, uh, surgeons have a saying. Uh, that bef bef make sure you, you study the patient very well before you start surgery because after you make the incision you will see exactly what you expect to see. And in fact it's not just surgery, we are doing the same thing. We tend to see what we expect to see. And this of course is a problem for science as it casts objectivity in a very difficult light. The only way this is addressed is by collecting observations repeatedly and independently and by inviting others to repeat the experiment. So we, we hope that uh, if there is enough uncorrelated verification, that whatever ambiguities or distortions there were will be uh, averaged out. We appeal to the uncorrelated quality of the different observations to minimize the impact of subjectivity. Uh, it is a miracle then that with these huge limitations, science is as successful as it has been in describing our world. And but then we may, but now now that we have a successful enterprise. We may ask whether these methods could be applied in other spheres of human activity, especially in the field of spiritual truth. This was already alluded to in a talk yesterday. I forget whose talk it was. Maybe it's your talk. But here's the idea that if the great teachers of religion spoke from the point of view of actual experience, and we have some record of what they said, then can we, on empirical grounds, extract spiritual truth from it. Note that I'm speaking of an empirical approach to spiritual truth and not an experiential one. If these teachers spoke at different times in different places, and if we have no evidence that they were influenced by one another, then even with the coarseness of the record of their teachings, might we extract those statements that are common and view them as spiritual principles established on empirical grounds. That's a challenge most of us do not dare to take because we are afraid that in doing so, some of what we hold as the truth may be compromised. But if we dare, and I think it's only academics that could dare, then we have a new approach to spiritual truth. So in Toronto, we're actually trying this experiment in the, in the Vedanta society that we have. We have a little Vijama there where we teach children. Uh, so I wrote out some notes based on the story of the great thinkers of the world, a selection of great thinkers from um, around the world, uh, and we're going to try to um, use that as the curriculum in the Vijaya Mandir to try to uh, explain from, on the basis of, of this kind of empirical view of the thought uh, from around the world that we can extract truth that is uh, common. So summarizing then, Science uses the empirical principle and the power of reason to arrive at truth, and to the extent that we're trying to describe an objective reality, these tools are quite powerful. But the question we now want to ask is whether they are of any use in discussing questions of ethics and of spirituality. These are not questions about the objective universe, but are deeply intertwined with our subjective identity. We're asking questions about ourselves, now, if we imagine society as an objective reality and models of social organization as being subject to empirical orderliness, we might try to apply the methods of science to discuss ethics and values. This is, for example, I think, the approach taken by Mill in his utilitarianism or by Rawls in his concept of social justice. 
Mill says that an action is right or moral if it maximizes the happiness function amongst the members of society. The difficulty with this, at least for me, is that happiness itself is not well defined. Rawls says that an action is moral if it's something that we would all agree with if we were objective. The problem with this is that there is no objective way of determining whether one is being objective. Another problem with both of these approaches is that in a given instance, we do not have the means to determine whether the conditions of morality or rightness are satisfied. In the virtue approach, action has to be consistent with virtue. Unlike the deontological and the consequentialist approaches, virtue ethics is not primarily rational, but it is a more holistic taking into account of the entire experience, not only of the individual, but also of one's surroundings and environment. I'll give you a little quote from an article I read by Sri Sisan Sushekarji. He explains, according to the virtue ethicist, morality is not primarily an area of rationality, insofar as what counts here are virtues, not pertaining only to doing good to others, but to the overall shining forth of the human existence, in balance and conformity with the animate as well as inanimate environment. Now we have said that, so therefore what can science teach us about ethics and human values? We've said that science as a discipline cannot analyze subjective concepts such as ethics and human values. However, the practice of science can teach us something so let me talk now a little bit about the practice of science. So the reason is that in the doing of science, there are certain social norms that the community has accepted. First is commitment to truth. Even if the data points to an ex uh, explanation that we do not like, we cannot escape the conclusion and we cannot falsify the data. If corrupted data is knowingly used in a scientific discussion, the community is quite harsh in condemning both the work and the individual. Involved. Thus, the practice of science teaches us about commitment to truth. Moreover, a model that intrinsically promotes inequality will meet with resistance from the community. In other words, if in the name of science, propositions are advanced that conflict with concepts of human values or ethics, such propositions will be challenged. Another principle that one learns through the practice of science is how it can unite people. While nationality, ethnicity, and other attributes can serve to divide people, the scientific community is a global one. Maybe more generally, the academic community is also a global one. A theorem proved in Chennai is the same as a theorem proved in Toronto, provided neither made a mistake. Uh, science can overcome political or other divisions amongst people, so one learns to look at the science and not the personality. Now, both of these, commitment to truth, and working as a global community are virtues that are not uncommon to practitioners of science. But, and here's the big but, if they could absorb those virtues into their entire life and not just their scientific life, then it would have served the purpose of virtue ethics. And what about concepts of right and wrong? The problem can be illustrated uh, with the following story of what happened after the Manhattan Project. The aftermath of the Manhattan, you know the Manhattan Project was the, the, uh, the uh, research project really to build the, the first atomic uh, bomb. So after uh, this bomb was successfully tested in the desert, and, and the brightest minds were there, young and old, um, the, uh, they were tested in the desert, it was successful, the means of delivery were made available, the question was, what do we do with this? This is a political question. How do we use this new weapon in the war which was then underway? President Truman summoned various groups to consult with them. So the first group was the leading scientists. Uh, so okay, the general said, drop it in the ocean. The third meeting was with the so-called lesser scientists. And he asked, Truman again asked the question, where should we drop it? And they said, on a populated place. Why? Because unless there's this large loss of human life, it would prove the devastating effect of the bomb. So that's pretty telling. Um, science did not provide these people with an equation that significantly factored in the loss of life and human suffering. This would 
naturally to most people who had essentially nothing to do with the waterfront other than to be born at the wrong place at the wrong time. Even today, there are people who might argue that as horrible as it may seem, it was the correct decision because of all the lives it saved by ending the war. And here, we have to admit, we have no objective answer to this. Nevertheless, we cannot dismiss the reaction of the leading scientists and the generals. So to conclude this story, the, the, what happened here came to the attention of the president of MIT. He was so affected by this that on his return to Cambridge, he ordered the construction of a chapel on campus. Moreover, the, the School of Humanities, which already existed at MIT, was strengthened, and all students were then required to take humanities courses in an otherwise science and engineering focused institution. So one might regard both the issue and the corrective actions taken as belonging to a virtue ethics perspective of asking what kind of person one ought to be and how our actions and pursuits can help us to be that kind of person. This was an acknowledgement that science and technology itself were not providing students with the means by which to make ethical people. I want to suggest that there is one common basis from which to understand both the spiritual quest as well as the pursuit of science. In science, we're trying to find harmony. Maybe objective harmony, maybe uh, harmony in the uh, physical world, but science is fundamentally trying to find a unity in existence. Scientific discovery, even mathematical discovery, is about uncovering a relationship between two things that were not known to be related. Of course, the scientific context requires us to express that relationship mathematically. But the attempt to discover unity uh, in the diverse phenomena of the objective universe can be thought of as a fundamental goal of science. Individual uh, Indian spiritual works go even further and suggest that the answers to the question of ethics and values are also to be found in the search for unity. A case in point is the final hymn of the Rig Veda. This is the hymn on unity, which says, let us walk together, let us speak in harmony, let our minds apprehend alike, common be the end of our assembly, united be our thoughts, united be our hearts, perfect be our unity. So the answer to the question of science giving us any insight into ethics or human values is that both the pursuit of science and the search for ethics are about discovering a fundamental and unalterable unity and to act in the light of that unity. Now, while science is forced to stop at the objective universe, the unity that uh, Vedanta, for example, proposes goes to the heart of the subjective question of who we are. The question of identity has been raised in both the East and the West, but the answers have been different. While the West identified the, the individual with the mind, uh, the, at least, uh, I feel more comfortable when I say Vedanta rather than Indian philosophy because I know there are many different perspectives in Indian philosophy. At least the Vedantic perspective is that we are consciousness and that consciousness can exist independent of mind. Moreover, consciousness is indivisible and thus the perceived multiplicity of conscious beings is only in the In reality, there is a unity at the level of consciousness. <coughs> And with that assertion in hand, ethics is derived as character and behavior that is consistent with that fundamental unity and interconnectedness. I want to close by describing another aspect of identity that is important to both science and spirituality, and maybe not discussed so much, and that is love. Love is the destruction of distinction, and so it is a tool to operationalize the principle of unity, whether it is in terms of ethical behavior, or in terms of scientific discovery, or in terms of spiritual experience. Let me start with scientific discovery, as it may be less familiar to you. If the picture you have, this is a question that was raised the other day, I think, by you. If the picture you have of scientific discovery is a forensic application of observation and reason, it is completely off the mark. Scientific discovery is almost never made like that, and we tend to believe that it's if a discovery is really made like that, objectively applying the reason, it tends to be superficial. You all know the story of Archimedes and his Eureka moment. So you know the story, he had to figure out this crown, 
is adulterated was the actual amount of gold used uh, in making the crown. And how do you test that without boiling the crown back into the gold? But then you destroy the thing you're trying to, that you want, wanted. So he, the story goes that Archimedes sat in the top and a certain amount of water was displaced and he realized that you, know, you could figure out the, the you know, specific density by the amount of water it was displaced and then you would know is it really pure gold or not. That was a moment of discovery. And what did Archimedes do? At least as the story goes, he ran from that public bath uh, uh, down the street shouting Eureka. What is that all about? That is scientific discovery. That is the experience of scientific discovery. What made him run down the street in that way? Discovery is almost always accompanied with an aesthetic experience, the rasa. And for a time, discoverer and discovery are united in that. And anybody who's uh, had that experience, in no matter what small theorem or what small discovery you made, will know that there is a moment of rasa. Now, Indian philosophy says that the answer to the question of our identity is chidananda. Or in English, and I'm not taking the traditional translation, in English, consciousness and love. This is the nature of sat, or being. Moreover, consciousness and love cannot be separated. As far as I know, this idea is not present in the Western discussion of consciousness, not even in contemporary philosophy of mind, such as in the work of Chalmers and others. Consciousness is seen by them as an instrument of knowledge, alone. What is needed now is to insert this idea of the inseparability of consciousness and love into this contemporary discussion. Returning to two verses that I quoted earlier on, I want to draw attention to the use. I want to draw the one was Sarvam Kalvinam Brahma. I want to draw your attention to the use of the word Kalu. You could have, the Rishi could have said Sarvam Midam Brahma. Why does he ask Kalu is, is a kind of, isn't it so? Isn't, that is an expression of joy. The Rishi has discovered something, he is over enthused to share it with others, and so he inserts the word Kalu. <coughs> Instead of just saying all of this is Brahman, Sarvam, Hidam, Brahman, Kalu, one can feel the joy of the Rishi through the use of this word. Similarly, the words of the Isha Upanishad mentioned earlier uses the word Bhunjita means to enjoy. All to suggest that both the search for and the experience uh, and the opera operationalization of the unity of existence is rooted in love and joy. And this seems to apply even if we narrow the field of unity to something like scientific inquiry. By failing to recognize the importance of love as fundamental to our humanity, we run the risk of an identity crisis. I said earlier that the most important I didn't say it right, but anyway, the most important, my view, my opinion, the most important philosophical question of our time is what does it mean to be human? It was mentioned earlier in a talk, I think in your talk, that CEOs are taking philosophy courses. I would say that now everyone will need to be taking philosophy courses to get an answer to this question. This will be the ex existential dilemma, the existential crisis of our time. What does it mean to be human? And while the Indian tradition has profound insights to offer, we have much to gain by exploring a world philosophy, and this requires a synthesis. The actual challenge in front of young philosophers is to produce a grander synthesis that has yet been attempted by harmonizing the different traditions. Moreover, such a comparative study and synthesis, while of interest from a purely academic point of view, is also going to be needed in our changing world where new existential challenges are waiting for us. The revolution in artificial intelligence is going to bring front and center the problem of defining our humanity. This will be needed not only to define the rights of the new species that we seem to be on the verge of creating, but also to explain to ourselves why we should bother living. I don't need to do anything. I can get whatever I want instantly. There's a Walt Disney movie that I saw a clip of. It's called Wally. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's about set sometime in the future. It's about a robot. And uh, it's an age in which all your needs are taken care of by machines. So there's nothing to do. So you have everybody is very fat. You just need to stick your tongue out and food comes to you. Uh, and so in that situation, there's just a question of what's the purpose of life? Why live? And believe me, if you think 
uh, the opioid crisis is bad. If you think the device addiction is bad, we are see, going to see something much, much worse. I, I, I suspect that suicide is going to become much more prevalent human condition. Uh, and so philosophers better be ready for this. Society will turn to its philosophers. Society will turn to its philosophers to help them deal with this impending existential crisis. Now, in the process of defining who we are, of answering yet again the ancient ontological question of what it means to be human, we will also have to deal with the question of what we mean by truth. We are already in the midst of a crisis of belief in which the sources of information that we have become accustomed to looking to are being vilified and tainted as offering fake news. We used to say that seeing is believing, and indeed Prachaksha was the first of the six pramana. But we have not now such sophisticated Photoshop and video editing capability that we can make anyone say or do anything. The tools which are meant to, to connect us and to empower ordinary groups of people and which played a crucial role in significant social and polit political movements, such as Arab Spring, have now been revealed to also have the power to mislead and confuse. Humanity has barely learned to grapple with the old problems, now these are old, old problems of peace, justice, and sustainable development, when it is already being confronted with new forces that threaten to undo whatever progress has been made. So it looks pretty bleak, and as I say, philosophers get ready because there's going to be an onslaught of demand for you. If I, if I paint a bleak picture of, of the near future, I say we, there's one consolation. One consolation we have is this, namely, we've been here before, though in a different form. When atomic power was first discovered and weaponized, it took a concerted and united global effort to ensure that it would be put under control and that its use would be for peaceful purposes. We need perhaps a similar global effort now to face the new challenges that technology is presenting us with. But at the back of such a global effort has to be a new philosophical understanding of the fundamental problems of truth and the identity of the human being. And that understanding is probably best obtained by, as I said, forming a new grand synthesis of the philosophical wisdom of all of the world's traditions. That is the task and the challenge in front of us, and I wish that all of us would focus our energies in this direction. Professor Kumarmurti for that very interesting and engaging lecture. Um, he covered a lot of ground. He started by explaining in a broad way the basic practices of science um, and then very nicely explained what some of the fundamental limitations of science are and explained how those limits of science then call for other disciplines to step in including both philosophy, spirituality, and religion. Um, and he also indicated toward the end of his talk that one common basis on, uh, of, of science and religion could be this quest for unity or harmony. So uh, let's take questions. We have about 25 minutes actually for questions. I, I think uh, Shilash first and then you would. Please, let me find me. Yeah, maybe you should just. Uh, yeah, well, philosophical wisdom and philosophy, we might need to make a distinction between the two. Uh, if you go uh, across a philosophy journal of analytical philosophy today, uh, it's like uh, going to a mathematics journal. You know, philosophers. <laughs> That's a pleasurable experience. <laughs> oh, yeah. But how much wisdom is there at the top? You know, they want to scourge the wisdom for. There is no talk about human identity, um, consciousness, and things like that. So that's a very important, uh, you know, um, caution, uh, note of caution. Um, uh, and another thing is, you know, when uh, the uh, reference to uh, um, the Kinam Tadeno, quotation to Poland, philosopher, Bernard Williams, I, uh, with my age, I tend to forget the names, proper names. Uh, to go to the olden uh, root uh, for answer to 
these uh, vital questions. Uh, now, what is happening in the West is to try to, um, in some quarters, in the large quarters, to mm, uh, see the answers lying in the Greek tradition only. There is a book uh, a couple of years ago published by Oxford University Press, um, uh, written by somebody of uh, Indian origin, Gandhi and uh, sto Stoicism. You know, to re reduce everything to Stoicism. He has mentioned, of course, the Gita. Richard Sorabji. Yeah, I know. I, uh, well, uh, maybe um, uh, there was some in unconscious intention that I forget his name. Uh, I don't deplore the fact. Uh, uh, anyways, I was present in India. So, so, I mean, is stoicism, I know, I'll be happy if I, if I get an affirmative answer, yes, stoicism, stoicism is, uh, uh, to an extent, a substitute of Vedanta and all that, but that uh, research has to be done. You know, we have to be very cautious. Thank you. Uh, I think Makran had a question. Could I, could I just say a comment about that? So, um, firstly, the, that's it. I mean, the point is that if we, the opportunity is there now. We don't restrict anybody's uh, academic or intellectual efforts. So people will present their, their understanding. So it's, it's then for us who have other points of view to try to develop those and present them on an equal footing. Uh, the other issue you said about the philosophical uh, uh, wisdom versus uh, the way it's presented academically. Uh, I might add, you see, this is an issue, a pedagogical uh, scientific issue. Um, in, a, in a math journal, if you, if you write really clearly so that it's really easy to understand, most likely your paper will be rejected. <laughs> um, also, if you give too much explanation, also if you try to explain all the things you see, uh, if you try to explain all the things you tried to get to your theorem that didn't work, your paper will be rejected. And so what you have is a finished product that looks like it's some immaculate, you know, God-given uh, uh, expression of reason. It's just like a revelation. It just flows. And this is, that's not the way it was done. That's not the way it came into being. And so uh, we, I wonder, you know, if we're doing uh, our uh, students and even our colleagues a uh, disservice when we present things like this. Uh, there was a very famous ma Swiss mathematician, his name is Euler, uh, his name Euler is associated with many, many equations. Uh, he used to write long, long papers where he tell all the things that went wrong into, in, uh, in his thing and that didn't work. And, then, and the, I think that's, there's a point in this, in that kind of expression. But, but we are caught in a system where we're not allowed to speak that way, except in certain private with our students. Mm -hmm. uh, it's what she Aurobindo has done. Classical Indian philosophers are always expressed in the form of shudras, and Aurobindo written pages after pages. Yeah. In, in the case of the classical uh, sutra form, it might simply have been that they didn't have pen and paper. What Well, I have a series of observations which are also a series of problems with your presentation because the entire presentation is predicated on uh, use categorical statements and descriptions of certain key words and concepts, science, math, spirituality, uh, ambiguity, and so forth. And on each of these assumptions of, or uh, statements on the side, there are several other kinds of statements. So the way you characterize science would be very different from the way that the J. Paul Farrakhan characterizes science. The way you characterize mathematics as devoid of ambiguity has been disputed by many leading mathematicians, including Gordon. You know, and it um, seems that you discuss that point. <laughs> no, I think I think also one of my big issues is you you seem to be completely unfamiliar with the entire science, religion, field of study, which is very well established. And many of the points you made, uh, for example, the non-overlapping, you know, magisterial. Magisterial. You know, yeah, magisterial. Yeah. Cool, that these are 
So how do you reconcile? So they say, well, this is the domain of science. This is the domain of other stuff, non-science, which is not nonsense. So both of these are non-overlapping magisteria. This is what Stephen Jay Gould said, who said, you don't refer to that. And you, I mean, it seems to be quest for unity. Swami Vivekananda said that. I mean, I would have expected you to engage with what he said and then show us how you differ. Right. I want to take that idea forward that both science and religion are quests for unity. So my difficult, and the thing that I like, the only thing I seem to have liked about you, people, sorry, <laughs> is that somehow scientists should be ethical. I mean, I like the Manhattan Project story. I like the you know, MIT story. And in a way, that resonated you know, in distant shores such as India, where all IITs, constitutionally, have humanities departments. And when I was teaching at IIT Delhi, I taught a course called Science and Humanism, which I hadn't designed. It was designed by you know, D.S. Kothari and others saying that scientists must be, so to speak, humanized so that they become ethical beings. So my, my point is that there was so much stuff going on in your paper which could have either been assumed as understood or you know, read or actually could have been disputed in terms of your assumptions about the nature of science, the nature of mathematics, the nature of other things. But the ethical point, I think, if one emphasized that and somehow tried to bring an ethical component to all scientific pursuits, I think that would have made sense. Because the, the last part, that you assume that, as you said, that now, you know, uh, scientific uh, research, discovery, they even conclusions that go contrary to what is considered political correctness are not. No, that's not science. That's politics. Because just a hundred years ago, theories of race, you know, phrenology, this was science. So, in fact, science is suffering because of political correctness crippling it. I mean, there are huge issues about IQ differences, the way the two you know, sexes operate, their biochemistry, as well as brain function, which are suppressed because they're considered politically incorrect. I mean, nobody wants to tackle a question such as, why should there be different chess championships for men and women? nothing to do with physical ability. And I think science is getting muddled on the one hand by all this other political correctness issues because we don't want the truth, you see? And in the end, as you said, Pratyaksha, I mean, you contradicted yourself because you said that we see what we want to see. Then that, that takes away your whole Pratyaksha argument in the end because post-truth is nothing but that. We see what we want to see and we can massage things I mean, okay, so let's give it a So, so uh, you have a lot in your comment. Uh, uh, firstly, I'm a practicing mathematician, not a philosopher. So, the, the fact that there is a lot of work out there is something I'm only beginning to dabble a little bit in. And I look to people like you who are experts to guide me in that. So, that's a welcome uh, comment. And remember, at the very first day, I asked you for a reading list. Uh, the, sec yes. uh, the, the second thing is that. Uh, you say you're happy that uh, um, a science, uh, scientist or science community has realized that it needs, it needs to be exposed to the humanities or humanities culture or ethics courses, but uh, maybe I didn't say it so explicitly, the other way has to happen too. Uh, that we need a kind of uh, um, uh, a scientific perspective can also help us in, in our humanities. So therefore, what I, what I would really like is an academic environment in which I don't categorize myself as this or that. I may prefer this, this field, I may like it more, I may be better at something, but I don't exclude and I, I don't excuse myself from engaging with the other community. This is something that universities around the world are only beginning to realize now. In a large institution like mine, the University of Toronto, nobody talks to anybody else. Partly we can say we're too busy, partly we can say we're too big, but whatever it is, it's a structural failure. Uh, and I would say that this is a lesson for any future institution that's coming up. Uh, the third thing about uh, the ethical component, you see, my point was this, and I'm, I'm sorry if it didn't come out clearly enough, the scientific community is self-regulating. In other words, 
it is true, it may be informed by whatever the intellectual is humans that are doing it. They may have their, their biases, their prejudices they brought for, into the discussion, but basically it's a community that self-regulates. And, uh, and this is not peculiar to science. I would say every field goes through uh, certain, uh, at certain times, certain kinds of discussions are allowed and certain kinds of discussions are not allowed. We are right now in a kind of very, um, kind of very highly sensitive phase where we, we, it's not productive to go in a certain direction. However, you know, uh, the theories that uh, uh, came up soon after Darwin, uh, of racial superiority and so on, they were, they were pulled down by the scientific community. Now, you may say, but wait a minute now, it's not racism or something, there is actually scientific validity to your in that. We're not yet at a stage of maturity to be able to discover that. So it, it, I don't see a contradiction in what I said. The point is that uh, it is a physiological fact that we cannot be objective. We are not. So the only antidote to that is that we work in a group. The community self-regulates. And so my, and the hope is that there is enough diversity in the group that my biases and my prejudices in, in the way I see things might be counterbalanced by your views, your biases, and your prejudices, so that together if we say, I know what I'm saying is a partial biased view, and I know your view is partial biased, but let's, let's at least be open enough to look at both of them together and deduce the thing. That's what I said at the very beginning, even when we try to discover uh, uh, you know, scientific truth, even if there's nothing controversial, I'm talking about the cosmos, uh, that's the way we work out the, the biases and subjective nature of perception. Um, so that's that's actually part of the way science works. Uh, Rupa, I have a follow-up question, then we'll go Sir, um, in the first part of your lecture, you described the practices of science with a view to finding out that whether uh, our spiritual experience, whether those basic practices of science uh, can in any way uh, be applied uh, to spiritual experiences and to the study of spirituality. You very likely observed that uh, the uh, natural sciences, they build up a model of, they dissect the universe, and then they build up a model of the universe, and then they look for further confirmation of that model on the basis of observation and experiment, uh, with the exception of mathematics, and I would also like to say logic. Because mathematics, with, mathematics also dissects the universe and uh, builds models of it, and then tries to prove that model with the help of sheer reason or logic alone. But you yourself uh, uh, observe that the main nature of mathematical and logical proofs is this, is this that they are too rigorous. And in order I to- I didn't say too rigorous, I said that it's rigorous. It's rigorous, at least. Uh, and you know, you know, in order to achieve that level of rigor, uh, it has to uh, achieve or it has to reach a very high level of uh, precisification. It has to be uh, uh, precise to a very great extent. And precision has a cost. Precision, uh, we are uh, attaining precision at the cost of uh, the breadth of the concept or the width of the concept. But if we look into the history of mathematics and logic, well, uh, don't we see that the entire history has been a move away from precipitation? If we look into uh, Cantorian set theory, uh, to the development of Fadi set theory, then rough set theory, from algebra to present day rough algebra, then also if we look into the history of logic, uh, from classical bivalent logic to many valid logic, to uh, fuzzy logic, to rough logic. It's a move away from precipitation. In order to correct uh, the feature of older mathematics and older logic, that older mathematics and older logic were unable to deal with large fragments of uh, ordinary uh, language or reasoning in ordinary language, which are not so uh, precise. Uh, why is this move? This move is uh, precisely motivated by the uh, realization that uh, ordinary, that uh, older classical mathematics and older classical bivalent logic 
were unable to deal with a very large fragment of reasoning that takes place in national language and in ordinary practice, uh, which are not so, which do not employ such precise concepts. So the entire history of mathematics and entire history of logic is in the opposite direction. Uh, and uh, the entire history of science also is somehow deconstructing the nature and the, uh, I should say, the concept of the object itself. Okay, let's have that. Okay, so elements of subjectivity and elements of uncertainty are entering into the concept of object itself in, in a very Kantian manner, I should say. Uh, the Kantian physics is being corroborated by major practice of science. So, uh, basic practices of science is changing. Well, okay, so in the first instance, uh, the, the way you were trying to um, recap, recap, recap uh, my description of science, uh, that uh, the model you know, uh, tries to see what it is. Uh, the one thing that sets math apart, uh, besides the rigor of the proofs, is that it doesn't need the universe. Sorry? It doesn't need the universe. That is actually what gives man its absolute power. It's the power of abstraction. And so where... It uh, doesn't need the actual universe, but it needs a domain. Without the domain, maths also can't function. Oh, hold, on, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Possible word. So, 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 so. <laughs> so, in, in, if I'm creating a mathematical argument, I create the There's a fundamental difference between experimental sciences. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, on. Okay, let's think. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. if I'm if I'm making a mathematical argument or building a mathematical theory, I define my domain. Okay. Uh, if I'm a physicist, I already have a universe to work with. I have to describe that universe. The power of mathematics comes from the fact that it has, it is. The very thing that uh, one friend kept uh, uh, talking to me over dinner, saying that mathematics is totally impractical because it can't uh, solve the problems of the world. Actually, it is, it is actually what gives math its power. It is, it is totally abstract and uh, can live in its own world. But then you may say, what's the relevance to anything else? Uh, we can, I mean, if I want to push back on, to, if it's your philosophers, I can, I can ask, uh, why should relevance of something be measured in terms of its connection to the physical universe. But even if we ignore that, the way deep mathematics is invoked, in other words, non-trivial mathematics is invoked when you have uh, physical theories, is you start with a mathematical model that is, yes, starting from something physical, but then once you have the model, you can forget where it came from. And then you can use, you can now take this model and use it in a domain that doesn't correspond to the, the original physical reality. And so therefore, suddenly now you have a purely mathematical uh, set of equations or model uh, on a domain that has no physical reality. You work on it, and then magically, mysteriously, it lands up over here in another domain that does have physical relevance. And so without, uh, and the people at either end are totally mystified that you started with their problem, but you solved two problems at the same time. Why? Because the power of mathematics will now enable you to describe some sort of meta environment uh, which is a, need not correspond to physical reality. That's not a bug, that's a feature. In other words, that's a, that's a strength of mathematics. Your uh, question about uh, this movement to the fuzzy business. Firstly, I don't know very much about this fuzzy stuff. Uh, secondly, if I think that what I understand of it is it's the, it's the building in of stochasticity into a mathematical model, and there's nothing uh, in, un, uh, ambiguous in a stochastic yeah. equation. Absolutely nothing. It's just a way, I mean, so this is something people don't understand. Even when we study probability, when we study randomness, when we study those kind of problems, it's totally precise and unambiguous. The very function that, that maps uh, the randomness is a well-defined function. And you're absolutely right that when we want to study not so much the physical universe, but biological universe, living systems, it's stochasticity that seems to dominate. So for example, there's a famous book by John von Neumann uh, called The Computer and the Brain. He wrote it in the 50s. 
just after he built you know, one of the first computers, ENIAC, you know, this huge computer in Princeton. And uh, then he wrote uh, a book called The Computer in the Brain, which is primitive, what today we would call a really primitive computer. His computer is not as powerful as your smartphone. Uh, and uh, so then he tried to say, well, where are we going with this? Is the computer going to, how does it compare with the, with the brain? And what he said was, the brain does not seem to use a digital architecture. It doesn't, we, of course, we know that. Moreover, the representation of information in the brain is not the way we're representing information mathematically or electronically. It has to be something else. And what is that something else? It's stochasticity. In other words, the, the question given is this. You have millions and millions of neurons in your brain. They're constantly fighting. And so there's this, this deluge of electrical information. Uh, and again, I tell you, these are all analog instruments, so they're subject to error. How in the midst of this barrage of information are we, are we getting any truth? You know, when, when we do a calculation, when we do an observation, we do, we don't, we get the right answer. How is that possible? It's only possible if the information is being represented in a different way than the way we're representing information. And that different way is stochasticity. In other words, the way that the, 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 the collection of neurons is communicating information is by the pattern of firing, not by the, whether it fired or not. But you have a million neurons firing, 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 and you map the, the pattern of that firing. That's what's conveying information. That's something different. So, uh, so it, it is true that when we try to model living systems, uh, deterministic uh, models are insufficient. So we need stochastic models, but stochastic models are completely fit into the paradigm of mathematics that I described. They are unambiguous. Uh, you can build stochasticity into an unambiguous model. Shepard? Okay. Hatta is going to be, uh, is going to ask, has been partially covered by Martin, but still I can teach him with that. Hmm. And that is, I also feel that your definition of science uh, has left out a lot. Of alternatives. It seems that you are focusing on the European science model and that too uh, of an earlier generation. Oh, can you turn on? Is your on? Now, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, so, I think that yeah, your definition of science, science um, could be further widened. Uh, Did I define it? Uh, yes, yeah. you made your definition. Why? I told you etymologically. You also used the word definition. Based on models and observations. No, I told you how science is done. <coughs> I didn't define it. So, okay. Pardon me? Uh, I didn't define it. So, I, I told you etymologically the meaning of the word, and then I told you how it's done. And how it's done is in a particular way that fits in with a particular definition. Could I put it that way? I don't know the definition. <laughs> no, what you're doing, you know. You know uh, what I, you're I know doing. the principles that are used, yes. Yeah. In what, you're doing, what, what, you're, what you're doing is partially dependent on, um, centrally dependent on, uh, empirical data <coughs> in experimental science, yes. in experimental sciences and there you uh, this is my second question the first question was that when you're talking about science since you're talking about mainstream European science there are other forms of sciences when, like uh, the Chinese modern science or Indian modern science which have been brought out in the fifth volume the history of science what you see there and Actually, also the feminist, the feminist approach to science, these are the main, mainstream science. So uh, I didn't see that reflected in your uh, general exposition of science. And I just want to gritty detail is that when you're talking about the empirical principles, it seems that you are using predictability as an epistemic virtue. And that is uh, under <laughs> a scanner, many people. Do not like to accept predictability as an epistemic virtue. Um, secondly, um, it seems that you are saying that science uh, has a lot to give to spirituality, or there could be an interface between the two. And uh, the major um, plus point of science, in spite of its uh, drawbacks, you are talking about some kind of objectivity. You did say that objectivity has many definitions. In my heart, but there is some kind of objectivity, some kind of impartiality, some kind of neutrality. Um, had that been so, John Lewis Bush's work 
would not have been bypassed for so many years, uh, especially his <laughs> discovery of the microwave. And later they had to apologize to Jagdish Bose for uh, the transistor. The microwave. That's my second observation. And the third observation I thought is very interesting because it comes it also comes very close to what uh, Tagore is saying. Uh, that we need the humanization of science and your um, equating consciousness with love. Now my query is that can you think of the concept of love without invoking emotion? And if you have love and emotion together, how does that factor into science? So. Um the last question is the most interesting. <laughs> uh, the first one, uh, uh, let me repeat what I said uh, in the beginning, that other models of science. I'm not a philosopher uh, or of science. I do science. I do math, in fact. I don't even do science. I do math, specifically. So I look to you to educate me on what these other models are, and I'm happy to, to give me a lazy list. <laughs> I'm happy to, uh, uh, to uh, learn from you. Uh, predictability, yes, I did think it's an epistemic. So if there's a, a other ways of uh, looking at this, I, again, guide me on that. Uh, objectivity, yes. The, the Again, I tell you, what I'm telling you is that it's a self-regulating community. It makes mistakes. Uh, J.C. Bose is an example. Chandra Chandrasekhar is an example. You know, he, on the ship journey from India to Cambridge, he, he did a back of the envelope calculation that predicted the existence of black holes. And his teacher was Eddington, which was like the god of physics at that time. Uh, he tried to show it to him, and Eddington wouldn't accept it. In fact, in a public meeting in the Royal Society, I believe Eddington spoke against Chandra. So, and, and these are just two. You know, you can all, you know, the literature is full of many examples of how bias has prevented certain ideas from moving forward. But the point is that it is a self-regulating community, so that in, in course of time, it, it's a, it means that all of us have to be vigilant. All okay, I mean, all, let me finish. Let me this. finish. All practitioners in the community have to be vigilant, and that in course of time, we have to call out those kinds of things. You were going to say something. No, I was wondering if you were bringing the notion of power over here, because when we are talking about these communities, then how actually we regulate this? Well, firstly, it's made out of human beings. These are not computers. So human beings are a full package. We're neither scientists, nor philosophers, nor spiritual people. We are a, a package deal. So, uh, you know, it's part of this whole business of trying to be fair and uh, ethical, <laughs> which is what we're trying to discuss. Uh, we do it, if, if at all, we do it imperfectly. And so the answer is not, as, as Vivekananda once said, it's not a question of the hero, it's not the person who never falls down. The hero is the person who picks themselves up. So we make mistakes, we stumble, but the community has to be vigilant and uh, uh, point these things out. And then if in spite of the, and in course of time, it has to be fixed. That's all. I mean, that, but, and that, by the way, that's not peculiar to science. Every community has its biases. I, I, I know, for example, uh, it is a fact even in philosophy. I know even the little that I know of philosophy, I'm aware of this. So, um, so it's a self-regulating community, which means it, it is a, a responsibility in our community not only to do our own work, but to be vigilant about what's going on in our community. So that's that's the, just before you go on, this issue of love, I don't know what you mean by love as an emotion. I, my view of love is that which, uh, through which distinction is, uh, is destroyed or annihilated. I, I don't know what, what how long do I separate that? Is it emotion? Is it not emotion? I have two simple questions. One is regarding the empirical principle. The, the empirical principle, principle. Yeah. that the universe has an order. Yeah. And you have also called it a matter of faith, which is beyond reason. Uh, we understand by empirical that which is experiencing or within the domain of experience. And if you say that it is a matter of faith, and therefore it is also beyond reason. I think that should be, or there is possibly, some kind of contradiction. Uh, so should it not better be said that this idea of the orderly universe is a metaphysical presupposition of science? So that perhaps would uh, be a better way of understanding. So what do you want me to say? You want to the metaphysical presupposition of so my, my, 
because the word faith is mischievous because yeah. religious yeah. Oh, sorry, I, I, gave, no, no, I gave it a definition but this one I did define as a faith means to accept something as true which is not the outcome of reason mm -hmm. If it is true, how can it not be out of reason? Who will make it true? I said I didn't say whether it's true or not. It's yeah. accepting something as true, that which is not the are rationally reason. accepting as true. So reason should be there. Now, anyway, that is uh, your viewpoint. Second question is: Modern science has been more or less value neutral. So value how neutral. do value neutral? So how do you bring values into science? I, I, I bring you back to one point, which all of you must. If you get nothing else from this discussion, please at least get this one point. Science is done by human beings, not by robots. You know, with all the progress in artificial intelligence, we don't have a computer that can prove a theorem. Humans prove theorems. Humans do science, and humans have values. <laughs> Einstein said famously once that uh, religion doesn't need science, science doesn't need religion. Human beings need both. So the way we bring values into science is that I, as a scientist, in, engaged in the field of science, cannot forget my humanity. Just as if you, as humanists, you know, must also cannot forget your rationality. Indrani, then uh, just Indrani first, then you. No, you have already hinted at one of the values of science that science is universal. Because science teaches to go beyond self, beyond ego. And because H2O is water for every country, for every religion, it is not something varies from one religion to another or one country to another. So going beyond universalization, that is one of the greatest contribution of science. It teaches to be secular. It is not bound by any religion. That is, that I say is the value of science. You want to respond? No, no, no. Okay, then. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you talk about community, do you mean community of scientists mm -hmm. in the manner of Thomas Kuhn? Uh, because Thomas Kuhn doesn't go beyond the community of scientists, and community of scientists and the scientific methods. You know, scientific methods and the community of scientists are given arbitrary power to decide in Thomas Kuhn. Uh, Karl Popper, who is a philosopher of science as well as a political theorist, he, when he tries to combine the two, he fails, admits his failure, and separates scientific revolutions and ideological revolutions. So do you want to go beyond the community of scientists and bring in the larger community in your picture. So my view was it is the community of scientists. Because if any, any larger community tries to regulate science, there will be a rebellion. So you ultimately you verge on Karl Popper. I was not separating the sorry. Give me the names at least. Okay, just I think Sanjay first and then Makan. I just have to add one small view. Science and religion. You mentioned both science and religion, I understand. Uh, I think uh, he also mentioned that science without religion is lame, and religion without science is blind. Maybe the other way around. Science without religion is blind because we don't have the ethical direction. The other way but, but religion without science without religion is lame. Science religion without science is blind. Okay, anyway, so he said something like that. What was your point? <laughs> what was your point? Hey, Sanjay, do you have a question? For no, I just wanted to add on what you were saying. No, but you, you said that Einstein said that science has nothing to contribute to religion. Religion has nothing to contribute to science, but both are required for human beings. Yeah. He's saying yes. that Einstein different also quotes. said... Yes, there are two different quotes, and what I didn't say it has nothing to do. I said science doesn't need, need religion. Exactly. But here he says yeah. it needs. No. He says science without religion is blind. So it needs science. Well, the needs. people can be blind. They don't know where they're going. They don't know where they're going. Okay, anyhow, I have a... Okay, but we, just we just can just end with my okay. I, I, I just take one more minute. I think I made the point again. Science without religion is lame because it does not... It keeps moving. Religion is the movement, the passion. 
this in philosophical sure. language. I mean, sure, sure. Uh, mathematics is their priority. Science is their posterior. Okay, I, I think we have to wrap it up now. Thank you all for the good questions. Let's have tea. And let's have it. Please, what's the title? Uh, the goal and his contribution to the world of ideas. Um, <coughs> why? Uh, Professor Shabari Mantra. Um, she, uh, I believe, she was uh, schooled at Shantiniketan Tagore School, uh, which has, or rather, if I can say, pain, you know, with pain in my mind, her, is it had a great tradition in philosophy. Uh, um, with uh, uh, Professor Kalidas Bhattacharya in the department and later on as head of the institute. Uh, and she was, uh, I believe she did a PhD there. Uh, well, okay. Kalidas Bhattacharya was a guy. He was a, one of the rare ones of modern day India. Uh, rare thinkers, um, and uh, she taught at uh, Jadavpur University. Uh, to my mind, I don't live in India. To my mind, it is still the best philosophy department uh, in Bhai. Uh, so she taught there. She is now retired, but very active. Uh, philosopher, and one of her uh, feminism is her field, one of the fields, and Ravindra Tagore, she has, she has been working on for a long time with her ability. Uh, we are happy, lucky to get her, you know, doing work uh, on Tagore. Uh, today everybody is a Tagore specialist. Uh, go to the West, uh, you'll find more of them. Tagore specialist. Um, uh, she is a genuine one. So we want to uh, learn a lot from her. Please. And I'm happy she consented to come and she was able to come. She was apprehensive about the uh, cold in, in, in late October. She, but she is doing good. Thank you, Professor Chakravarti, for giving me this opportunity. I think it is on. <coughs> it is on. The green light is here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me now? The volume is being controlled there. No? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it is on. Yes. As you said, that the title of my paper is Tagore and his contribution to the world of ideas. My um, expectation was that I would be uh, presenting this paper in front of Professor Smoot. And uh, so many of the things written here are in anticipation that he would be one of the audience and certain very fundamental things perhaps known to everybody over here have been included presuming that he has a better acquaintance with Chinese philosophy than he has with uh, Indian philosophy. At least that is what I gathered from my conversation with Professor Chakravarti. <coughs> Unfortunately, he isn't here. The second thing is that we were given two, two things. One is that this, the title of this paper was suggested by the organizers of the seminar. Many of us have uh, tampered with the title, uh, which I have not, uh, because I thought, is that better? Ah, better. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have not tampered with the title because I thought that this also makes sense. Um, that was one thing. Then the second thing is that we were given 
copy of Professor Slope's uh, recent publication, which I have been through. Uh, reading uh, his work, certain um, parallels or uh, certain similarities came to mind that these could also be the same concerns, the same problems have been um, addressed by Tagore as well. But uh, directly speaking, that if we say that this is a, uh, a seminar on virtue ethics, <laughs> then I'd say that <coughs> There could be a controversy regarding whether Tagore at all has a theory of ethics, and there could also be a controversy regarding whether he would like to be called a virtue ethicist or not. I do think that Tagore has many insights that would impact a virtue ethics position, or somebody interested in virtue ethics would perhaps be interested in looking into some of the sources that I have cited over here, I have given copious um, references to places from which I have culled uh, his ideas, having in mind that some people may be interested in probing further and going into Tagore's works independently and uh, try to find out that whether they would like to construct his ideas in the way that I have constructed them. I say this because we all know that he was not a systematic thinker and he did not want to be referred to as a philosopher as in the morning uh, in Danny mentioned that Aurobindo did not want to be referred to as a philosopher but we do think that both of them, both Aurobindo and Narendra were uh, philosophers. Further, uh, the reason I have given these uh, uh, references is that now for the past 15 or 20 years, not before that, Tagore's English writings, those are the writings, not translations by others, but his own English writings, have been published in four volumes, three of which have been published by Shahidka Academy, Delhi, since 1996. And the fourth volume was published after the demise of Professor Shishir Kumar Das. The first three were edited by Shishir Kumar Das. And so those of you who do not have direct access to the Bangla sources of Tagore will find a gold mine of uh, information in these volumes because each volume considered that it's a, uh, a four size page and uh, each volume consists of about, about 900 pages, 850 to 900 pages. So four volumes is a, a considerable amount of literature that you will be able to access. There are so many things that uh, Tagore has said that people uh, would perhaps think should have been brought into the uh, scope of this discussion, which I have deliberately kept out. <coughs> One reason is that uh, I have discussed those uh, issues separately. Another is that I thought that issues like Jibal um, Devata or Munir Manush, uh, which are very central to Tagore, um, I have not brought in over here. I have tried to develop his ideas in uh, as simple a fashion uh, as without going into some very uh, metaphysical, uh, philosophical questions. Primarily because I think that to understand uh, those concepts, it would be uh, necessary to go into his literary works, not only his essays, but into his literary works. I have uh, confined myself to his uh, articles only, and not to his, uh, his stories creative writing, poems, etc. So with this uh, introduction, let me uh, begin. This is uh, I've written out the paper, but I tried to elaborate in various places. <coughs> Rubinunath Tagore, 1861-1941, was neither a systematic philosopher nor an, nor an ethicist. He was a poet who referred to his religion as the poet's religion. And there is an article by this title, the 
poet's religion. And the poet's religion is quite a nonconformist kind of a position if you uh, look at the traditional situation, uh, scenario in which he was brought up and the background uh, through which Tagore came. He deviated from his family position considerably. Which neither this this uh, religion neither adhered to a doctrine nor to Indian trends. So it is fluid. This is, this is his own description that it is fluid and never leads to any firm conclusion. So there is kind of open endedness over here, and uh, therefore the positions which we talk about that we need to uh, sort of discipline people inculcate habits of a particular type, if those are taken as injunctions, then Tagore would uh, resist them. He never subscribed to any standard ethical position like consequentialism, uh, deontology, virtue ethics. Uh, nor did he provide a fully work out, worked out version of virtue ethics. He was not concerned with the systematic study of mainstream Western ethical issues. The way virtue ethics has been portrayed over here, basically it seems to be a Western concept, and we are trying to find out the, the parallels uh, with our tradition. But uh, <coughs> the Western concept, uh, concepts that we come across in ethics, like concepts of rights, concepts of duties, concept of motives, intention, moral choice, theory of justice, and these never attracted Tagore in terms of theoretical concepts. Though his views on each one of these issues, like rights, duties, justice, motive, intention, etc., his views on these issues would, however, be extrapolated from his very writings, and that is really an uphill task. So if you ask me that what is my original contribution to this paper, I would have a great um, take-home message that's novel. But I do think that I work pretty really hard looking at various sources and finding out footnotes, uh, comments, you know, places where he has said things that can be sort of strung together to bring some semblance um, of a position, quote unquote position, on a particular issue. His views on each one of these issues would, however, be extrapolated from his varied writings. The conventional categorization of ethical issues is well suited to a compartmentalized approach. And we have gone over and over this uh, issue yesterday and today, that whether our approach should be segmented, building block type of method or analytic on the one hand, or whether it should be holistic. Tagore's approach has always been a holistic approach. Tagore was interested in the overall development of human personality and its relation to the universe. This called for an integrated holistic approach. And I'm using integrated very loosely, not in uh, all of those terms. The principal dimensions of this whole were science, religion, morality, and creativity. And um, all of these are sort of knit together, and they knit together in a kind of narrative. The interrelation of these dimensions is evident in the understanding of the overall development of human personality. In, under, in order to understand human personality, we need to understand human beings' uh, relation to science, relation to religion, relation to morality, to creativity, and so on. As in empty holism, the understanding of one dimension of the whole necessarily entails the understanding of its interconnection with the other dimensions. So in order to understand science, you have to understand his idea of morality, uh, creativity, uh, spirituality, etc. No single aspect could be comprehended in isolation. A piecemeal understanding of the different aspects would not add up to the whole. So it's not an additive uh, approach, his whole. Whole means really a holistic approach. So Tagore's entry point into the discussion of these intersected parts, parts, intersected parts, I mean that, that uh, science, religion, morality, creativity, 
his, his entry point into this was through the understanding of human personality. And taking human personality as a central consideration, he branches out into these uh, other directions. And as we know, that in the history of philosophy, there have been different entry points at different times. That in the Greek period, we thought of metaphysics as the entry point. In the age of enlightenment, it was the epistemic term. Epistemology was the entry point. With the linguistic term, language was the entry point. And I always like to <coughs> believe that post Second World War, there was a political term. And politics was also an entry point to philosophy. So Tagore disapproved of the tendency to view things in dissolution by putting moral maxims in place of human personality. You can't talk of moral maxims in isolation. You have to talk of moral maxims in the context of human personality. And this is from his uh, book, Personality. Uh, uh, man is in search of the meaning of the universe, the meaning of reality, and the development of his personality in tandem with truth and reality. He makes a distinction between truth and reality. Which have not gone in, uh, into in depth. But uh, broadly speaking, truth is confined to the inquiry of science, and reality is, is associated with spirituality. Now, answers to these questions can only be found through an individual's internal search for reality. An external mentor could not facilitate an individual seeker. So he refers to some village uh, bauls, religious, they are members of a religious sect, who were uh, talking about the spirit within. And he uh, asked them that why don't you take this message from row to row and tell people about your religion. And uh, the two uh, strangers was that uh, one has to go to the river and drink for themselves. This is not something that can be taught. So Tagore refrained from all forms of proselytizing, be it moral or religious. So there's no such thing as the Ten Commandments over there, or uh, even a list of virtues that these are the A, B, C, D virtues that you have to inculcate in at the young age of when he speaks of the individual's internal search for reality, he does not imply that each, each individual has an insular, arbitrary understanding of the world. Though he's talking about the individual personality and he's talking about looking within, there is also a connectivity between individuals since he's talking about a whole. I'll come back to that. According to him, man is individual and yet universal. The elements of the world are his own, yet his world, that is the individual's world, is not wholly unlike the other's world. Tagore speaks of man's universe as a product of evolution, and he has his own theory of evolution. It doesn't uh, fit in with the Darwinian theory or the other prevalent scientific theories that were prevalent at his previous time. And it's also very different from Aurobindo's theory of evolution and evolution. Tagore speaks of man's universe as a product of evolution. In his The Religion of Man, he speaks of light as the radiant energy of creation. And I, I have tried to briefly give his theory of evolution here, because then only we will understand where ethics comes into the picture of human progress or how it comes in. So he says in the beginning, the planets came out of their bath of fire. Then came a time when life was brought into the arena. So in the beginning, there's no prime mover or creator or Brahman who is responsible for this creation. Here, it seems to be a very scientific, uh, secular type of initial beginning that planets came it's very poetic, no doubt, came out of their bath of fire, 
Then came a time when life was brought into the arena. This is a quote, and I'm continuing the quote. Before the chapter ended, man appeared and turned the course of this evolution, unquote. And this is something that Indani was also speaking of, that how man plays a central role in, in the creation drama. But the role here, I think, is uh, very different from the role of being created or being known. And that difference especially uh, is centered around the uh, admission that uh, imagination plays a central role in uh, the definition of man's personality, which I, you were talking about creativity, but I didn't find the same kind of treatment of freedom and imagination as we find in Tego. Maybe I'm wrong. With the advent of man, a shift took place in the course of evolution, and I quote, from an indefinite march of physical aggrandizement to a freedom of more subtle perfection. So in the previous phases, this unquote, in the previous phases, evolution was the result of natural selection. With the appearance of man and his mind, evolution was transformed to, quote, the purposeful selection of opportunities. So there is an agentic role being played by man. There is a purposeful selection of opportunities. And this purpose would have a norm, but it's not always a linear movement from evil to good. There may, there's a possibility of many kinds of deviations from any normative idea. The purposeful selection of opportunities with the help of his reasoning mind, unquote. So reason has been given a central position over here, but it is not the only regulating feature. The first two stages of the evolution, drama, are marked by matter and life, respectively. In the third stage, man's consciousness of his own creative personality ushers in a new regime. Now, man directly attempts to fully, fully capture the government and make his own laws prevail. So, now man tries to understand the mysteries of nature through science, and then accordingly tries to control nature and create civilization and create his own laws. In the third stage of evolution, the regime of life recedes to the background. It doesn't vanish. It recedes to the background, and the regime of the spirit of man occupies the foreground. Since man embodies both the biological realm of life and the spiritual realm of mind, he has a dual identity of being both man the mortal and man the eternal, simultaneously. And as uh, Makram had mentioned, I understand, in the previous session, this is something that Einstein and Tagore were debating, that how can man be both mortal, contingent, finite, and eternal, and infinite at the same time. And there Tegor said that this is a paradox. And he says that this paradox was here before I was born. I am not responsible for this paradox. And here, uh, repeatedly, he refers to the Ishopanisha. So it's interesting that uh, Ishopanisha has been referred to by uh, Sri Aurobindo. I think he made 10 or 11 uh, attempts to translate the Ishopanisha, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Rabindranath Tagore's personality um, article is also based on a verse-by-verse -verse interpretation of the issue. It's Ishopanisha. kind of a commentary on, on the uh, in modern times. Which, which is and very different and very uh, radically different from the traditional uh, way of understanding Ishopanisha. So, however, this is the third stage of evolution where the regime uh, recedes and man. Uh, since, uh, Man, the eternal and the finite biological man is simultaneously formed. Tego refers to man, mind, and personality in the realm of life by using initial lowercase letters. The same concepts are referred to in the spiritual realm 
by using initial capital letters, and in the he spoke of the same thing in Sri Aurobindo, but he is distinguishing this um, difference through using capital uh, letters. Man misses himself when he is isolated and unrelated. Now, repeatedly we have been talking in these two days about um, what is the universal message that we can get from a particular uh, uh, position, whatever position we were discussed in Gita or in Sri Aurobindo or whatever. But here we are beginning by saying that my, to understand man's personality, we have to understand man in a related fashion. He finds himself in his wide human relationship. He lives in a world whose life is bound with man's life. Relationships keep expanding and get more and more inclusive with the growth of personality. Now, if you ask that what is the probative force of this growth, or is it a sort of determinism that this growth is definitely going to take place and unity is definitely going to take place, that he doesn't say anything. He does say that it's quite possible that we just stagnate in the second stage of evolution and keep there for millennia. And that's quite possible. And it's possible that we go beyond that. So interpersonal relationships keep widening as man's relation with the universe keeps widening. In the early stages of evolution, progress took place in a linear direction. With the advent of man, the direction of progress changed to the ever-expanding relation of concentric circles with man at its center. The uh, metaphor that I like to use in class is that if you throw a pebble in a pond, then you find uh, circles and larger circles and larger circles. So we can think of our relationships expanding uh, from our family to our community to our country, beyond our country, to the globe. Tigger writes, quote, from individual body to community, from community to universe, from universe to infinity. This is the soul's normal progress, unquote. He refers to this unity as an energizing truth. So if we feel energized, if we feel good about it, then this could be a kind of progressive force that we feel better when we are related or we have a good relationship and we feel morbid when our relationships break. For him, the consciousness of this unity is spiritual and to be true to it is our religion, simply. Our religion is related to this unity and broader and broader unity till we reach the infinite. I, I repeat, from community to universe, universe to infinity, this is the soul's progress. In this ideal unity, man realizes the eternal and the boundless in his life. Through the realization of this ideal of unity, man becomes man the eternal, both a capital man the eternal, in this life itself. So all this talk about Zivanu, Yovan, this kind of expression, you could say that if uh, unity with the infinite is realized, then this can be achieved. Tagore refers to the original power or energy as the supreme person which permeates over all living things. Now this is where uh, a lot has to be said, I have not been able to elaborate this, that the supreme person, once he says supreme person, once he says fire, once he says energy, so the supreme person is not to be personified into a personal God. This implies that all living things are both finite and infinite, both descriptions are simultaneously valid. How the opposite forces are reconciled in creation is incomprehensible. Even though the forces come from opposite directions, they act in absolute harmony. As a manifestation of the infinite, all living things must possess freedom in some form, because the infinite is free, and if the infinite permeates all, then some form of freedom must be there. So at the very the initial stage of evolution also, there is some kind of freedom. And this is what I was try trying to um, get across um, when I was asking my own question about uh, freedom. And he was saying that, of course, there's freedom. There's freedom of T 
changing your habits or recreating yourself or freedom of looking at yourself in different ways, if I understood you correctly. So before the arrival of man, the freedom in the realm of living things is like the circumscribed freedom of the cage. In the initial stages, man was also confined to this cage-like existence till he realized his agency and he took over the governance. Man's agency or freedom progresses through two discernible stages. In the first stage, man asserts his agency by freeing himself from the oppression of the cage. And for that, science plays a major role <coughs> to free man from the oppression of natural forces of disaster. He tries to transform hostile nature into a conducive habitat. Through, this, through science, man gained the capacity to unlock the mysteries of nature and to overcome its oppressive control. Through science, man is constantly getting power over nature. Freedom which leads to separateness and relief from the clutches of nature, that is, man is now distancing himself from nature, controlling nature, governing nature, using nature. This is characterized as freedom from dot, 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 that is freedom from, let us say, disease, freedom from poverty, freedom from whatever. So, in short, it's freedom from. This is a negative type of freedom. With man's ability to break away from, from the circumscribed freedom of the cage that comes into prominence, what comes into prominence is his spirit. Spirit has a surplus far in excess of man's biological needs. The spirit is always there, but the realization of the spirit comes through the realization that as an individual, I have the surplus in me, surplus in the sense that the little that I need to sustain myself, my existence, after using that uh, energy, I still have surplus energy. Now what do I do with that? Surplus allows man the space and leisure. I'd like to underscore leisure. Leisure is a very important uh, notion in Tagore's philosophy. And by leisure, he doesn't really mean uh, the way uh, we would uh, define leisure in a capitalistic society, that you work for six days, and the seventh day is a day of rest. That's your day of leisure. Leisure, I will be elaborating, is a way of life. It's a, it's a dimension that you can add on to your existential life. And it is something that you can enjoy while you're working. So it, it's that the, the two aspects that we have of the biological and the eternal, actually leisure relates to the eternal in us. So the surplus allows man the space and leisure to fulfill his dreams to create. But if you if we are below the say the a benchmark of poverty, uh, then we don't have the feeling of surplus. And if we don't have the feeling of surplus, then we don't can't enjoy the feeling of leisure. Leisure has a special significance in Tagore's writings. It is related to a broad perspective and to a space through which an individual can contemplate on the meaning of existence and the value of existence. Tigur says, quote, man has his two phases, unquote. In one phase, quote, he mastered his resources and utilizes them for his own purpose. Through the manipulation of nature's law, that is, he's governing the nature's law. This is one phase. The other phase of man's life pertains to wisdom, where quantification has no role According to Tagore, quote, the value of truth is realized by mature mind through patient devotion, self-control, and concentration of faculties. Now, someone might say that these are virtues. Here yeah, he's talking about virtue. I have <coughs> no quarrel with that. 
The value of truth is realized by matured mind through patient devotion, self-control, and concentration of faculties. It has it as its atmosphere of infinity in a width of leisure. Unquote. Man's awareness of spirit and its surplus makes him aware of this atmosphere of infinity. He is now able to free himself from, quote, the compelling claim of physical need. So he gains a new kind of freedom with his awareness of surplus, which is different from the prior freedom from, quote unquote freedom from. <coughs> he now has freedom to create or freedom uh, to uh, take a walk or whatever. So freedom to again is written with freedom to ellipses, dot and dot. Freedom from provides independence without content. Tagore says, quote, we must have the possibility of the negative form of freedom, which is license, before we can attain the positive freedom, which is love. And for him, love is related with emotion. And emotion has a very central place in his scheme of things just as emotion, uh, imagination does. Freedom to enable man, freedom to enable man to strike new relationships and to unite with his surroundings. So we can strike a new relationship even with the sunset, see it in a very different way. We can strike new relationship with our environment and with other human beings also. Perfect freedom lies in perfect harmony of relationships. And so there is a relationship, I may have a relationship with the environment, another relationship with my dear ones, and if there is a conflict between the two, then there is no harmony. So perfect freedom lies in a perfect harmony of relationships. The two forms of freedom, freedom from and freedom to, are not sequential. They can be jointly enjoyed. So similarly, leisure and speed, are, I was thinking of Ramanda's article uh, presentation yesterday, when you are saying that um, these are the uh, corporate sector uh, anxieties, problems. So I was thinking that whether we could translate this idea of speed to some of the anxieties of corporate sector, that the corporate sector is producing an atmosphere of speed, almost like uh, Charlie Chaplin's modern times, produce more, 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 and you go and tightening the uh, screws. So the two forms of freedom, freedom from and freedom to, are not sequential. They can be jointly enjoyed. Similarly, leisure and speed are two attitudes that may be jointly cultivated. They were believed we cannot and should not try to stop the increasing quickness of speed, which is, which is a necessary corollary of our modern lifestyle. So he is quite aware of the speed that is coming with the uh, new kinds of conveyance, new kinds of connectivity in our modern lifestyle. Side by side, we must also value quiet time so as to give balance to the reckless rush of ambition and to give rhythm to life that misses its happiness. Rhythm is something that he repeatedly uh, refers to, especially in the context of harmony, chandur, that we must have a rhythm in life. Tagore concludes his essay, and the title of the essay is The Philosophy of Leisure. That's, that is the title. So he concludes this essay by saying, quote, compressed and crowded time has its use when dealing with material things. But living truths must have for their full significance a perspective of wide leisure, unquote. With the coming of freedom too, man is called upon to give, within quotes, to give, and no longer incessantly appeal to get. 
Yesterday, Professor Chakraborty was making a distinction between the popular idea of religion, where we keep on uh, asking for something from God. And this I'm uh, repeatedly reminded of during the Durga Puja festival, when they use the microphone and you can hear them chanting, Tata, Yasho uh, Dehi, Vitam Dehi, Putra Dehi. So it's always Dehi, 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 or giving something. So here we come to a time of time when man is called upon to give. He takes on the role of a sovereign creator who builds his world as well as governs it. And this is a kind of villa, kind of game that goes on between the supreme person who is the one, undifferentiated, and therefore cannot remain in that identity and yet have the experience of love, experience of emotion, the experience of separation, viraha. So he has to create human beings in his image, <coughs> in God's image, so that there can be a constant interplay of two creators, the supreme creator and man as the creator. So man, however, does not build his world on a clean slate being a creator, so there will oh, be anarchy and uh, anything goes kind of situation will come about. As Tagore says, quote, man is born also to his home, his society, and his country. So th this is a paradoxical situation or, or a kind of uh, tricky situation that we often misunderstand Tagore because he was against nationalism that, and he was talking about universal man that maybe he was talking about a kind of uniformity of human beings. No, he was very much in favor of maintaining the differences in location, differences in culture, and vichitra. That is not something to be just glossed over. That is something that enriches our existence. So man is born also to his home, his society, and his country. These afford him the background the perspective needed for the expression of his complete being. On the contrary, when we talk about globalization today, we are talking about a unipolar world. And so there is a tendency towards uniformity among uh, all cultures. Each society, and this is Tagore, each society provides its own context and perspective for expression. Every society is an organ of universal man, Vishwan. The stability of a society is dependent on what it contributes to the growth and development of universal man, Vishwan. So there is a kind of check and balance in the way uh, societies develop and are sustainable. The stability of traditional Indian society was sustained, this is Tagore's view, was sustained by relationality. Tagore refers to the traditional Hindu custom of daily remembering, and he uses the word Hindu. This is from a Bangla source. I, I have uh, rendered it in English. Hindu custom of daily remembering our blessed relation. The Bangla is Mangala Shamanda. I don't know what would be the problem this translation, our blessed relation with God, with the Rishis, with our forefathers, with all human beings and all birds and animals. If this is remembered and followed, it will be propitious for the individual and for the world at large. So this is a prescription that is not local. This is something that he thinks that would be a beneficial for human humanity at large. This is from Akshoshokti. We need to know things in their relationship to the universe. A unity exists through the harmonious mutuality of elements. There is a rhythm of cosmic motion that produces the creative emotion. The best opportunity for the blossoming of this emotion is in men's society unless it degenerates. When society degenerates, then that is not a conducive atmosphere for the blossoming of 
these motions. Man feels the mystery of unity in the life of social communion. Through the cooperation of minds, through hospitality and love sacrifice, creative ideas slowly develop. This is again Tagore's understanding that through cooperation of minds, Professor Murthy was talking about on this community, cooperation of minds through hospitality and love's sacrifice, <coughs> creative ideals slowly develop over the centuries. Many years of hard labor has led to the development of human civilization. Human civilization is not come in a day. So no creature has to work so hard as men. Making the making and reformulating laws, constantly thinking, searching, and suffering so as to become that which he is yet not. With the growth of civilization, man learns to cherish the value of civility. Now, that you could say is a virtue. To learn the value of civility, which according to Tagore, is beauty of behavior. Civility can be perfected only through patience, self-control, and an ambience of pleasure. Genuine courtesy is like an artistic production in which there is a harmonious blending of voice, gesture, movement, word, and action. Courtesy is an expression of expansiveness of conduct, through which man is revealed without any further motive. So what is the motive? If there is no motive, why should I do it? This is something that uh, man aspires after, uh, civilization, civility, as an end in itself. Civilization is created with the objective of realizing our vision of the spiritually perfect. For perfection, man has to be vitally savage. This is his expression, vitally savage. Which means he has to be natural. So on the, on, on the dimension of naturality, naturalness has to be fully natural, uncultivated with nature. At the same time, because there's that paradox, the finite and the infinite, at the same time, he has to be mentally civilized, which means he has to be human with human society. Human will. Human will passes. Now I'll, I'll stop elaborating and just read through and then we can discuss. Human will passes first through the negative stage of detachment to the positive stage of relatedness through love. Man is revealed through love and goodness. A distinction needs to be drawn between pleasure and goodness. Pleasure is for oneself, it is contingent, whereas goodness is concerned with the happiness of all humanity. This is where ethics comes in. It is timeless. When we realize ourselves in love, we gain the greatest delight. The spirit of love is the spirit of civilization. To be happy, we must establish harmonious relationships with all things with which we have dealings. In the absence of harmony, we are aliens in this world. Lack of harmony with one another leads to pain and suffering. Harmony can only be achieved through creatively modifying relationships. It can, it's a balancing act. So it cannot be achieved through compulsion. We must learn to keep step together. We need to nature, we need to nurture, this is his expression, man love, man hyphen love, monoprim. For all creatures, according to Tagore, from the time man became truly conscious of his own self, he also became conscious of the spirit of unity manifested through him in his society. Man has a special relationship with the infinite by virtue of his unique human characteristics. What differentiates man from other creatures is his inner faculty of imagination. Imagination <coughs> in its higher stages is special to man. In contemporary times, we are made to understand that our compelling claims of physical needs can be well looked after by market forces. 
De Gaulle laments that in former times, intellectual and spiritual power had their independence and dignity, whereas today, money power has taken full charge of our existence. He refers to this stage as the impetuousness of passion. As a result, our social equilibrium is destroyed and moral callousness has gained ground. Taylor says utility should never forget its subordinate position in human affairs. But unfortunately, we have allowed utility to uh, occupy the driver's seat. Let's skip this. Uh, he points out that in earlier times, success was not looked upon as the objective of war. It was honor that was at stake. He category that refers to success as Shudra. For him, Shudra is one who merely has use, use value and in whom the man who is above usefulness is not recognized. The important lesson that man can learn from life is that it depends on him to turn pain into good and that it is possible for him to further transform it into joy. Thank you. Beautiful huh? and the uh, extremely potent talk, uh, also the source of the potent talk is the potent ideas of Tagore himself, but to catch those ideas uh, is a, a veritable challenge. Mm. I wouldn't myself make any comments, but uh, we'll uh, accommodate a couple of very brief questions, uh, please, because we have this end of time. Uh, just one comment, um, <clears throat> I'll leave myself with that, is the holism that she started with uh, about Tagore. I uh, really wonder if this holism is the cue of Tagore, relating Tagore to uh, virtue ethics. Uh, if there is any way the virtue ethics can, of today, uh, developed in the West, can benefit from this holism found in Tagore, that's the question I end with. Uh, yes. Uh, so, can I respond to this? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I thought your presentation was a good summary of Tagore's ethics, but I was, it was surprising to me that you didn't discuss any scholarship on Tagore, because there's a vast kind of scholarly literature yeah. on Tagore. And Secondary sources. Exactly. Mean. It would have been helpful, I think, I mean, starting with the founder of the IAS, Shrala Radhakrishnan, wrote a famous book on... How much time would you give me? <laughs> okay, no, but I'm just, what, <laughs> how much time would you give me? All I'd like is, what are, what are some of the dominant scholarly approaches to Tagore's ethics, and where do you stand with respect to the existing scholarly literature? Right, as I said right in the beginning, I thought Professor Sloan would be here and I would have to introduce Tagore himself before I start on the secondary sources. Secondary sources will be pertinent only for a person who already has the primary sources and they're interested in the debates. So I'm actually uh, at a loss to know where to pitch my ethics. Perhaps I pitched it in the wrong place. But can you say now briefly or is that not possible? No, briefly. Well, she will uh, hope, well, I hope she will develop that in the uh, paper we will expect from each and every, uh, from her, in course of, uh, you know, my expectation from each and every to, be, to go into a book. So we will, uh, if, yeah, yeah, if, yeah, if, yeah, if you can, very briefly, please. Very briefly, as I said, that is the his personality. And I think that that would be the key to virtual ethics that it is the personality that has to develop in a very specific way in order to pass from the finite to the infinite, the progress that is talking about. And that is where the virtues will come in, that without the virtues there will be a stagnation and negative freedom will be achieved, but positive freedom where the surplus is enjoyed, understood and utilized will not come without the virtues. Okay. Yeah, please make it very brief. No, I'll insist, no, no. please. Yeah. Yes, Shekhar refers to similarities between Shurabindo and Prabhunanath. Yes, there are many similarities. And in fact, that is the thing that in them we also find, if we try to analyze their relations in relation to 
for two ethics. That is, they are talking about emotional aspect, rational aspect, and at the same time, <coughs> they are not propounding any principle because there are many virtue ethicists who are anti theory. They say that we cannot bring theory here. So, in that way, they are also development of personality is development of character. Because there is a major difference between Aurobindo and Rabindranath's interpretation of Ishu Punisha. Where Rabindranath says that if you are uh, limited to the finite, you are in darkness, and if you are limited to the infinite, you are in further darkness. And Aurobindo is not. Shreya is the same thing. No, but for Aurobindo also, the way <coughs> that there is a very close similarity here from finitude to reach infinite, because. The will to be immortal. That's a different issue. All right. Well, uh, um, uh, between ourselves and talk, um, I guess we'll uh, say this ends here. Um, this session, beautiful session, should have come to me for hours. Uh, I believe, uh, I deplore the fact, you know, what we are ending with. Uh, Spe uh, speaking about Sri Aravinda and Tagore together, uh, uh, that hard, hard day of her, uh, the, this, uh, we don't have a chance uh, of that. And speaking of Tagore and Sri Aravinda together, how they are complementary uh, and how they hold together, I mean, that hardly ever takes place. Thank you very much, Professor Bertha, for your beautiful start. There is a lot more there, uh, we all know. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh.